Good evening, everybody. We'll uh, call to order this planning meeting of the Council of the Town of Saugeen Shores. And good evening, everybody. Welcome, uh, welcome to the Council Chambers this evening. Uh, the first item, uh, well, we have no additions, deletions, or amendments. So the next item is disclosures of pecuniary interest. And I'll ask any member if they have any pecuniary interest they'd like to declare on the agenda. I'll let committee know that I have a pecuniary interest with one item on the agenda. That is item 5.1, the Saugeen Golf Club application. I have that pecuniary interest because my father-in-law is a certificate holder in the golf club. Uh, so when that item comes up, um, I will turn the chair over to the Vice Deputy Mayor. The next item on the agenda is adoption of minutes. Uh, and uh, I have a motion that has been moved by Vice Deputy Mayor Huber, seconded by Councillor Mayette, that the Planning Committee minutes dated July 16, 2018 are hereby approved as amended. Are there any questions or comments to those minutes? Seeing none, all in favor? That's carried. So that takes us on to public meetings. And I'll just, uh, ahead of getting into the public meetings, I'll let the public know that we have two items on here, 5.1, 5.2, that are uh, items that are just for public input. Uh, and items 5.3 and 5.4 do have uh, decisions attached to them. Uh, so uh, we will be... Uh, Hearing public comments, the procedure for each of the public meetings will be uh, first to hear the report from the planners. Uh, next, there'll be an opportunity for members of the committee to ask questions uh, for clarification. And uh, then finally, we will take comments from members of the public who wish to speak on each of the applications. We'll ask members of the public who are interested to approach the podium and uh, give us your name for the record when you do speak. So that moves us on then to item 5.1 and I will vacate the chair. So this is a public meeting for zoning application 34-18.44 from the Saugeen Golf Club. The property address is Bruce Road 3 and the Dahl Side Road. And first of all, we'll ask the planner to make a comment. Okay, thank you. Um, so the application is to amend the town's zoning bylaw. Um, the lands are owned by the Saugeen Golf Course. Uh, they abut their, their operational lands, I guess. Uh, to the uh, to the west, and um, they're proposing to create two lots. So this application is running concurrently with a Bruce County official plan, um, because the underlying principle of use is through the Bruce County uh, official plan, and the zoning uh, more so refines um, the use of the land uh, and in terms of the shape and form um, of what can go on the land. Uh, the Bruce County official plan amendment has not been um, uh, subject to a public meeting before uh, Bruce County's Planning and Development Committee, uh, just an FYI. Uh, so this is the first public meeting of two on this application. This one, of course, is for the zoning. And just to give you a, um, a highlight, I guess, or overview of how the policy framework is structured uh, for this piece of land. The, the underlying principle of use um, is through the Bruce County official plan. It's currently designated rural in the Bruce County official plan. Um, the official Bruce County official plan has a policy that says um, essentially uh, no more than three lots uh, can be created from the um, original crown lot um, with this one that that cap has been met. So the amendment to the Bruce County official plan is to allow more than three lots um, on the original Crown uh, land. And it would also establish um, study provisions that would be required to, um, to ensure the viability of the lands for, for a residential use. And in the orange there, the lands here are the ones that are subject to a zoning bylaw amendment. Um, so, so the the underlying use, if approved, the county official plan would allow more than two lots in that area uh, on on all of the subject lands, and then the zoning bylaw amendment would um, would rezone the lands from open space three. Uh, which they currently are to agricultural, which is the uh, the zoning uh, 
provision in uh, outside of the settlement area where lots, residential lots, uh, can be created. So uh, hopefully that wasn't too confusing in terms of the policy framework structure. Uh, here's here's a bit of the proposal in terms of what the applicant is proposing. So it's two identical lots, um, and within that um, within that orange area, and that would again rezone them from the open space three to the agricultural special, and the special would be um, zoning provisions related to frontage and lot area. Um, In terms of agency comments, the county, um, the town has indicated if the county chooses to approve the OPA, um, allowing the consideration of two lots, the town will require uh, a nitrate study to determine if groundwater is appropriate, appropriately protected from additional septage and a stormwater management report as well as a comprehensive grading report. The um, proposed zoning bylaw amendment is outside of the SVCA's regulatory area and they didn't flag it um, uh, uh, they, they flagged it as being acceptable uh, to them. Uh, there was a number of public comments received for this and they were um, attached uh, as appendices to the report. Just in summary, they um, more so, re more or less related to impacts to groundwater, impacts related to agricultural, uh, natural heritage impacts, drainage impacts, and, uh, and general quality of life uh, as a result of the proposed zoning bylaw amendment. So to recap, um, it's from open space three to agricultural special. Um, it would allow the creation of up to two lots in conjunction with the Bruce County official plan. Um, and those two lots or the number of lots would be determined through uh, the various study requirements that will be associated with the official plan amendment Bruce County official plan amendment to establish the viability of the lots. So it may be that uh, it's one lot, uh, depending on what the studies come back and say, or, or it may be that uh, it, no lots are viable. So it's, it's creating the possibility of up to two lots, um, depending on the viability of, of the lots as demonstrated through the studies. So that's it. of the applicant. Now the red light is on. <laughs> I'm old, bear with me. Anyways, Madam uh, Vice Deputy Mayor, members of council, and um, thank you for the opportunity. We have uh, attempted to do our due diligence by meeting with the county several times on this particular application. And it is unfortunate that the Bruce County um, meeting uh, was originally scheduled for August the 9th, which would have been excellent timing, 9th in the county and the 20th here, and you would have then already have had the decision from the county in front of you. The concerns of the local residents are always important, and we, we take those with a, with a high degree of, of, uh, of concern. Uh, clearly, uh, no one is interested in impairing or impeding groundwater. And I, and I think the one study that, uh, that Dan has mentioned will certainly help in, in facilitating concerns around that particular issue. It's more towards drainage, I agree. But there has been comments made from the deputations that this is primarily a low-lying area and subject to ponding, uh, I think was the word used in the springtime. So impact to local wells, we're certainly cognizant of it. But, but I'm, I'm, I'm confident that with the summer we've had, which is as dry as it's been in the last multiple decades, uh, none of the uh, concerns expressed by the public in their, in their letters indicated that any of them had actually run dry on water this particular year. Certainly, agriculture has to be front and center in our community. It's a very dominant factor in our business community. And, and the comments made by the farmers directly across the road are, are certainly acknowledged. Um, I, I would suggest, though, that their concerns around odors um, and, and other byproducts of, of the, uh, the farming operations are certainly no different than any other lots that have been constructed and, in fact, um, would have impaired or impeded or impacted 
some of the existing severances that already occur in that corner. And they seem to be cohabiting quite nicely. And, and, and so I'm, I'm convinced that the purchasers certainly will be made aware of any potential negative impacts from that type of operation. But I, I would say that they would be cognizant of it and, and certainly desirous of living in a rural setting and, and would recognize the possible implications of that. As, as to traffic, um, it's, it's unfortunate that uh, Mayor Smith wasn't here today because he was the only one on council in early 2000. We actually upgraded the construction when we rebuilt the Dahl side road to facilitate heavy equipment, uh, which, which augmented and supported the farming community, but also was recognized as one of the two arterial routes to the uh, landfill site. So I, I don't believe that the two additional residential lots will significantly increase traffic um, to the extent that it would be um, a detriment to the enjoyment, quiet enjoyment of the, of the neighboring properties um, in, in that it, it, it's simply two additional families that would be in there since we're looking at single family residences. I, I think that is, is most of the uh, content of the objections. Um, I know there was comments about indigenous species, species at risk, and, and, and certainly it's, it's again something that will come through in, in the process of actually obtaining a building permit. And, and if there is an instance of that, then the purchaser again must be aware of, of any special requirements that they would have in, in terms of obtaining a building permit and, and protecting the environment accordingly. So. The golf course, I believe, has been an extraordinarily good neighbor to the, uh, to the um, public that have submitted objections to this particular application. We have been, I think, uh, uh, a very good neighbor in terms of our relations with them. I'm not sure that we've impacted to any significant degree their lifestyle and, 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 and impacted their right to quiet enjoyment. And it would certainly be our, our goal to continue to be a good neighbor. Uh, in closing, I'd like to introduce you to you, the rest of the people that are in attendance this evening from Saugeen Golf Club. We have the President of the Board of Directors, Mr. Kerry Turcott. We have the immediate past President of the Board, Mr. Michael Raven. And we have the current Secretary Treasurer, I believe, Doug, or just Treasurer? Vice President. Vice President. There you go. He's got more mantles than I knew. Uh, you will know Doug Freiberger. So, again, Madam Vice Deputy Mayor and Council, thank you for your time. If you require any other comments or input, we'd be happy to do that at any point in time. Thank you. You didn't um, indicate your own position. I am uh, Mark Kramer, and I am a member of the golf course, and I'm also a certificate holder and have been for some nigh on to 30 years, I would guess now. I've been a member for 34 and a certificate holder for roughly 30. Uh, for those that aren't aware of what a certificate holder means, the golf course is a nonprofit organization. It's run by a volunteer board of directors, and the board of directors are accountable to uh, 100 certificate holders who have paid a fee to become a certificate holder. Um, each year the board uh, is reconstituted. There are three directors that time out each year and it is the responsibility of the certificate holders like myself to ensure that we have uh, full composition on our board and that they are also responsible for actually voting for and electing the board. So we are not in a, we are not profit motivated here. Uh, any proceeds from the sale of these lots are simply going to be plowed right back into the golf course. Um, it is, as you know, a challenging environment uh, economically in the golf industry. And any asset that can be turned into a producing asset in the manner of these two lots is certainly going to uh, be very, very helpful in the ongoing operations of Saugeen Golf Club. We take pride in the course. It's also in the process in September we're hosting the Senior Rider Cup which means that 130 of the finest senior golfers in the province will be attending Saugeen for a two-day tournament. I would encourage anyone that wants to enjoy some tremendous golf uh, to come on out and, and partake of this celebration. So um, in a nutshell, this is not profit motivated. It's, there's, there's nothing in it for anybody that's here other than to hopefully ensure the go forward success and ongoing viability of Saugeen Golf and Country Club. Thank you, Madam Vice Deputy Mayor. Are there any questions from council? Um, any questions from anybody at the moment? I think I'd, I'd rather let the public speak and then we can open it up for questions from the committee. Okay, thank you. We did receive a rather extensive um, collection of, of emails and letters that came in, um, in in an appendices 
are in appendices that were attached, but um, members of the public are invited to speak, and certainly, you know, you're welcome to come up to the mic, identify yourself, and make your comments. Good evening. I'm Wanda Drusnowski, and I live at the corner of Dahl Side Road and Bruce Road 3. Good evening. Um, the one question I had, and is it Dan? Um, when the Crown put the cap on, when was that? You had said at the beginning. Well, you didn't say the year, but you said the that, cap had that, made a that, crown. That policy stems from the, um, the date that the county official plan was um, was approved, which was, I believe it was 97. 1997. Is that right? Written in 97. There you go. Okay. 98. And was there, was there a specific reason why there was a cap put on it? I'm not sure. I think the intent, uh, often with rural lot creation, is... Um, through the PPS, there's limited opportunities for rural lot creation. Um, so, so this would, in a sense, create or allow the potential for limited lot creation while encouraging uh, the majority of um, lot creation to occur in, in settlement areas. And, and that there's several reasons for that, I guess. One is impacts to agriculture, uh, the efficiency of land use in an urban area, and so on. Okay, thank you. My concern um, is I have um, a small acreage. It's only seven acres, but I grow my own hay. Um, I have horses, um, and I have my land worked without chemicals. In the spring, um, the entire area along Bruce Road 3 is saturated and wet. This year, when we had even dry spells, the end of my laneway and the hay field was wet, soggy wet, as I go th around, you know, mowing my tractor wheels or spitting up water. So I don't know that the water table um, is because it's dry outside that we have no water. My concern is, is with redirection that my hay field, my property will be subject to more water if the uh, redirection of the water from those that lot area happens. Um, additionally, I am worried about the species. Um, when something's gone, it impacts each living thing down that chain. Uh, there are a number of um, reptiles, uh, birds, um, four-legged mammals that live in that area and use that as a corridor to go from bush to bush. When you create um, lots just for the sake of increasing the viability and production uh, financially to keep another business going, that's not enough. I know that um, the golf course um, at a public meeting a couple of years ago that I attended was proposing to make a subdivision off Bruce Road 3, and that never came to fruition. It was sort of an information policy. So I can't believe that these two lots now are, an, are a diversion because they didn't go through with the other to be able to finance the viability and continue keeping the golf course working. Um, The properties in the area have been that way for a very long time. To jeopardize the land use and take away the heritage nature of the land is saying that the rural community as such for nature, for agriculture, is not important. I see the development in sogging shores, mass productions of housing. Surely, um, you know, there has to be some balance on what now is going to start in the rural areas. Joni Mitchell once said, once you 
lose what you've got. What, what has, how does it go? Um, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. And we need to protect those areas that are vibrant with life, whether it be wildlife, agricultural use. It's part of our heritage. Our forefathers worked hard on the land. And I think there is enough urban land available for development. We don't need to start cutting up rural land as well. Thanks. Thank you, Wanda. Thanks. Good evening. I'm Doug Pedwell. I live at 244 Dahl Side Road, right across the road from this. And I do have a large number of concerns over this. Um, I have been involved in this process before, and I've had concerns since then. For example, I was told when I expressed in a previous setup that um, by senior staff members of this uh, organization that drinking water uh, production zones didn't matter because uh, Sogging Shores gets its water from the lake. The urban population does, the rural population doesn't. And if you look at the uh, water protection zones, in fact, right across from Wanda's, there's a sign, water protection zone. Most of the wells in this area are shallow wells, 30 feet. If we go down farther, we have to get into a very large expense of drilling. Then we have iron, sulfur. We have to get rid of that to make the water palatable. Um, so that I do have that concern about just that kind of stuff right there. I would strongly recommend that this committee, before they make any kind of decisions, have a good heart-to-heart -heart talk with the township or town of Georgian Bluffs, because a similar situation occurred at my mother's place in Georgian Bluffs. They put in a house, they redirected the water, and now 12 to 15 years later, they're still in lawsuits from the flooding that occurred because they redirected the water without any planning. And when you read the Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority's report, they clearly state there has been no surveys, no water studies done. Yet, if you take a look at the maps, the topographic maps uh, of this area dating back, you see that they all show the area as wet. There's such a strong tradition. Each spring, and I've never quite understood it. And because of the droughts at 89, and I had to take, put a new well in my place, because the well which ran for 100 years, which was only 15 feet, went dry. In fact, my neighbor across the road used to come over and load water from my well. Uh, that, would be, that property would be 219 Dahl Side Road now. He would come over and get water for me for his pigs. So I could supply water. I can't do that now. I had to put a new well in. We're not sure why the water changed, but it did. So I've become very aware and I've been very conscious and very observant of what the water is. If that ground is wet in the spring, sopping wet. All you have to do is drive up the Dahl Side Road every spring and you can tell where the water table is. There's a line on the road. It's wet from that point on. And if you look at the road, state of the road right now, you can see that the uh, road is subsiding in many places. It's being undercut by water. This was an old lagoon, a glacial lagoon from Lake Algonquin. Um, so this is a naturally wet area. And if you look at the map I, sub I submitted, I showed the drainage pattern. Sorry for the lack of artwork in that, but that's what I had to do. I also have told members of the board of Soggy and Golf Course about the listed threatened species that were there over the years. I've pointed out, I was very concerned because we do have a little reptile, the Eastern Ribbon Snake, it's less, less than, it goes back and forth across the road. Every fall it goes across, every spring it comes out. I've never gone in to, recently to look for it because of the no trespassing signs, I just look from the side of the road. I also know that there are a number of species of birds that have been nesting there, and I'd like to thank the golf course, you have been a good neighbor. I also like the concept that you've left that grow and with all the milkweed that's there, we have become one of the best butterfly uh, nurseries for monarchs in the, the area. I can't believe the number we have. 
But what's the use of a butterfly? It only pollinates our food. So, um, those were the key concerns. I am concerned because when they go to build there, they're going to have to drain the land. Either that, they're going to have to dump a hell of a pile of dirt in there to put a house in. And if they do drain the land, it's got to go north. And the Sheehan's property is going to get even wetter in the spring than it is now and maybe and stay a lot wetter than it is, which could impact on their pasturing of cattle. It could also affect the area across the road where uh, grain crops are growing. Even though that field's been tiled, there are some years, and yes, we did have a lot of rain two weeks ago and no rain for eight weeks. I've been on water rationing. I haven't watered my front lawn since May. Well, I didn't water it in May. My front lawn died. Okay, I have to live with that. I have to keep track of the water. And I have to recycle water and that kind of stuff. If I'm going to do something in my garden, it isn't a sprinkler. I'll go with the little buckets and do it individually. So there's a pile of things that you have to look at. And you have to understand, you have not had any studies done. You do not know what the impact is. And when I alluded to Georgian Bluffs, that's exactly what happened to them. There were no studies done. Uh, Gray Sobel said, oh, we don't see any problem. They built the house. They totally changed the water direction. And now they're into lawsuits and have been into lawsuits ever since. And that's something that you need to be aware about. Because in my comments, I said, if the water table's lowered, who's going to pay for my new well? And why should I pay? So think about it, because you could be leaving yourselves wide open, big time. So those are the key things. I am majorly concerned about water. I won't see the houses, because I've got bush between me and the houses. Um, I would be concerned about, not so much about traffic, but I would like the town to come and pick up the garbage that's left by the cars from, and open trailers from Port Elgin, but that's another story. And I'll be back for that one later on, maybe with some mementos for you. Um, I think those are the key points. Water. Preservation. Oh, yes, the other thing. Saugain Shores is not doing a very good job of protecting its land. If you start this kind of dribs and drabs, I don't know whether you paid attention to the CPC News last week, but one of the things that came out in was the fact that in order to feed the world's population for arable land, they now need something the size of Canada to just to meet today's needs, period. And guess what? We're using all our best land for houses. Yeah, people have to have a place to live, but maybe you should build up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pedwell. <laughs> Are there any other members of the public who would like to speak? Uh, good evening, Council. Uh, my name is Richard Sheehan. We live at uh, 333 Dahl Side Road, just north of the proposed development that uh, the golf course is looking at here. Um, just to reiterate what the other two people have that have come up and spoke, groundwater is a concern. Um, a folks from the golf course had mentioned that it hasn't been listed as a in the uh, letters that have come back, but it actually is a concern for anybody that lives out there on the ground ground well. Um, you monitor your well on a daily basis to make sure that you do have water to be able to function the way a normal household would. Um, we're the last house presently that has built out there. We've been there for 10 years and when we moved there the full intention was to leave the property as intact as we possibly could. So we pasture cattle, we pasture horses uh, on the property um, we've done significant wildlife improvements to the property. Um, when we moved there, cattle could get it through the bush. We've fenced that off and we've done uh, major improvements to help the species at risk in that area. I walked that property many, many times with the Conservation Authority to uh, be able to do a lot of the things that we were able to do. And uh, my family really believes it would be an absolute detriment to the area to see 
a development, which I think this is what will eventually happen if we open this up for two houses, happen in that piece of property that their golf course is looking at. So I just I just wanted to come up and say um, we are strongly opposed to it and uh, hope the council turns this proposal down. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sheehan. Anybody else who wish to speak from the public? If I can ask Councillor Maya, can you just push the button off on that mic and um, members of the committee? Councillor Maya. Thank you, uh, Vice Deputy Mayor. Um, I, I, have, I have a few questions, and uh, one of one of uh, Mark Kramer of Sullivan Golf Club officials, um, and then I have a couple of the planner, if I might. Um, first of all, I, I want to thank uh, Wand and Doug Padwell for their for the comments. There is significant uh, concern about about water flows and severing of the of the water patterns out there. I'll get to those in a sec, but Mark, I'm just wondering, has there been um, good discussion with, like if you had the opportunity to meet with surrounding neighbours one-on-one, -on -one, uh, you're talking about potential studies that have to take place and, and, and putting their minds at ease that this could be a good development for these reasons and, 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 and about wells. How much discussion, first of all, has taken place between Saugan Golf Club and, and the residents out there? So at this point in time, Mike, I'm not aware of any one-on-one -on -one contact. Uh, we were only made aware about 10 days ago that there were some concerns from the neighbors. So um, the letters of objections they came in seemed to be dated somewhere between the 6th and 8th, 9th of August. So okay. uh, you can appreciate, Mike, that there's, it's only really been a week since the letters came in. So there hasn't been a lot of time for us to respond. Okay. Sure, thanks. Uh, if I could add something around the water, uh, Councillor Mike, if you don't mind. The water protection sign that's across the road from the, the first uh, member of the public that spoke was actually installed by the Source Water Protection Committee, uh, which was charged with the responsibility of drafting the guidelines around the implementation of the Clean Water Act of 2007. I was fortunate enough to sit on that committee for seven and a half years in drafting those guidelines. And the water protection sign that's there is, 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 has been erected as a caution regarding any impact to quality of water as opposed to quantity of water. And I think it's important that you understand the difference of what that sign actually is for. The water protection, the Source Water Protection Committee in drafting the guidelines around the implementation of the Clean Water Act said that thou shalt not do certain things within defined parameters of existing wells. So that sign is there to protect the wells of the existing residents in that area, not having anything to do with quantity, but absolutely focused on quality. And, and I think that's a very uh, important uh, item that people understand. Thanks, Mark. And if I might then to, uh, to you, uh, Vice Deputy Mayor, to our planner. Um, there are, I read all the correspondence from the, from the residents in the area and there are, there are concerns about dug wells and there are concerns about the, the uh, natural draw uh, from rainfall and there are some concerns about current, current natural water flows and if severed, what will happen. Um, the, first, the first question I have is to do with water flow if it's severed, uh, Dan. Um, Will this be addressed? Any, 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 any approvals? Any, any from your recommendation standpoint? That's the first question. Will that be addressed? I heard Mr. Pedwell say up in Georgia Bluffs there's a situation where, you know, lawsuits uh, are, um, are on the, on the move up there or have been in the past or maybe still are. Certainly, don't want to create risk, liability, damages to the town of Saugeen Shores. We want to, want to be able to stay clear of that. So, um, will this be addressed prior to prior to any approval? Um, and I just wondered the, the, the name of the study, Dan, if, if, if there will be one, and I'm assuming there would be, um, is uh, addressing how dug wells in the immediate area may be affected uh, as a result of these two lots. Um, what, what does the study curtail? What, do, what does it include to ensure that the um, severing of any um, <clears throat> movement of water is not going to affect um, the residents in the area, 
uh, with the creation of those two lots. Um, obviously, that's, that's something that, that, in my view, needs to be addressed. So we need to protect the municipality. Um, we don't need future lawsuits. So what, what's, what's the name of the study? Uh, what does it curtail? And um, will the, um, we'll be addressing prior to any approval that, that where water flow severing may take place. So just explain that to me. Okay, thanks. Um, so um, I think you asked two questions. One on, on groundwater um, uh, supply and the other one on um, overland flow. Um, so <clears throat> as part of the Bruce County official plan, proposed Bruce County official plan amendment, um, the approval of a consent uh, of the severance would be contingent upon uh, the lots being demonstrated as being viable um, through a number of studies. Um, so um, specifically that would include an, a nitrate study. Um, so that study will look at the impacts of the, uh, the septic field and, and making sure it doesn't run off um, past the property line and impacts water quality. Um, hydrogeological impact study, I think this more specifically relates to your question on groundwater supply. So that, that will look at uh, the existing supply of water. Um, it's conducted by a professional engineer using uh, prescribed method, which I'm not uh, um, terribly familiar with, um, not being an engineer, but um, uh, it, it would uh, it would have, need to demonstrate there's a viable um, supply of water. Uh, stormwater management report, and that speaks to your question on the the uh, overland flow of the water, as well as um, part and parcel with the comprehensive grading plan would would uh, all combined. Um, help us as planners demonstrate that the lands are viable for a residential use. Uh, nitrate, uh, hydrogeological, um, stormwater and grading are often done together. So three, three to four. Just as a follow up to that, um, the applicant complete has their own, um, completion of those, right? Are, are those reports peer-reviewed? They, they likely would be. Some are required by uh, the town. Um, so that would be um, the stormwater and grading plan. Um, the, um, the hydrogeological may be uh, subject to peer review, as, as will the, um, the nitrate study. Uh, I believe, and this is um, maybe challenging for some people to to um, get their head around the official plan amendment um, states the study requirements um, as it's proposed now to go forward to council and it hasn't gone unfortunately to a public meeting it would be to the satisfaction of uh, county and town staff so um, if we review it and and need to know more information if it's viable uh, it would be subject to peer review I didn't really close the, the public part. I noticed, Mr. Pedwell, did you want to make another comment? This is actually an answer, part of an answer to uh, Councillor Myatt's question. I have been personally contacted by two board members of Sogging Golf, Golf Course, and I expressed my views at that time and outline more or less exactly what I've said to here tonight. And the other thing I wanted to point out is I do have a very good handle on the uh, geology of that particular area. The aquifer is actually fairly shallow. It's only down about 33 feet. So anything that can get into that will spread very quickly because it's almost liquid down there if you can get into it. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions, comments from the committee? Wanda, sure. Thank you. Um, just one last comment. Um, when we talk about quantity versus quality of water on the protection, I could understand uh, what Mr. Kramer is saying um, on a general 
sort of political stance. However, when your tap is turned on and nothing comes out of it, water is our life. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Mayette. Thank you, Mrs. Ms. Chair. Um, looking at the aerial photograph here, and I think one of the, I think it was Mr. Pedwell said that the the fields certainly to the north of him, and I see uh, there's there's fields to the uh, east and to the west as well that are under agricultural use, and uh, and those were presumably tiled uh, for drainage to make them viable for for cropping and uh, grain grain crops. Um, when that was done, uh, was there a negative impact on the quantity of water from the aquifer to the existing properties? I guess I'll invite Mr. Pedwell to, to make a response. In answer to your question, that may have been part of why my shallow well went dry but we're not sure because there were a couple of things that happened around the same time I know that the uh, field has been tiled twice uh, not the whole field um, it's just where uh, the uh, grain crops are growing and I have seen in August the combine stuck and up to its axles because the water flows but then that was a wet year this has been a basically a dry year and we are still in certain spots wet and other places are bone dry as far down as you can dig with a shovel. The aquifer is not universal in the area. It's, it's it fingers uh, and, uh, and streams. There are fingers and streams, and I've always in, referred to the situation where Mrs. Robertson is and 219 Dahl Side Road is a wellhead that seems to be almost, um, almost an artesian type thing. and. There is a big cap of uh, clay down there somewhere. And I know that it's quite near the surface down the Denny's Dam Road. But this is a basin, and how far down it is, I don't know. But that's part of the reason why sometimes the water just sits in the ground. And I've been thankful for that, but I have had to be very, very careful. And at times we have had to, let's say, restrict our showers and maybe go visit somebody and use theirs kind of thing. But those are things that we have accepted by living there. I, I'm totally familiar with that. I live on a rural property yeah. with a 18 foot well. Yeah. And it's tiled all around me. And I understand that there's times when during the dry spells you have to ration. Oh, yeah. Um, but the aquifers are typically not affected by what's happening on the surface. The aquifers down below are streams that are running down they, there. They, uh, they do. They do run. And uh, that's why one of the reasons people water. Are water witchers because they can somehow ma manage that find where the stream yeah, is that's right that's right and the, the streams seem to radiate from that area over there but what I'm really trying to get at is how those two developments are down in order to make that property dry suitable for habitation put a lawn in and all that kind of thing come on people who are going to move into a rural area would like to have their urban environment so what they want to do is they will probably they will have to tile it, they'll have to drain it, and if they hit the aquifer, they drain the aquifer. That's my biggest concern. And the aquifer in that area, at least from, because I haven't done the formal studies, I'm only basing it on observations. I just find it very interesting that wherever you have things like the ozier or dogwood, that's an indication of how wet that area is all year. And over in that area, there are patches of ozier or dogwood, and I know that from previous experience, streams are literally coming out of there. They dry up in the summer, but the ground is still often quite wet. I have gone over there before the no trespassing signs were up there and when Mrs. Robertson owned the property because she gave me permission to go look for stuff. I've been in there in July and it's been sopping wet. And then I've also been in there when it's been absolutely bone dry. The wells that she had for her cattle there, she couldn't water the cattle because they kept going dry. She had seven wells in operation to feed the cattle. So it fluctuates, and there's no explaining of how it operates. And that's the biggest thing. It changes over time. It changes yearly. What is good this year will not necessarily be good next year. 
But your expectation. Okay, is could I ask that you have the? It's not a dialogue. Okay, between, sorry. It's, it's you, you. If you could okay. pass the questions through me, All right. Dave. Council Mike, so sorry. The, the expectation then that I'm hearing is that the, the whoever is going to apparently an urban dweller is going to buy these lots that they're going to want to drain the whole neighborhood to satisfy themselves. Where typically the lots that I've seen built in the in the urban or rural areas is you build them up to to the height you need, and that would be what I would expect would happen here. But I just I'm a little bit confused, uh, Mr. I, Chair, I, as to I, whether I don't, it's I don't too dry think, or too wet. I don't think we have building plans in. Um, that yeah. we're not at that level of, of detail yet so no I understand that we are not at that level I'm voicing my concerns I, I admit I'm taking a worst-case scenario mm. I have to I know that but I also been there 35 years and I've paid attention because I have had to pay attention to what the water levels have been doing thank you are there any other Neil, Councilor Minaj thank you vice deputy mayor my question, I've got a couple here. One would be to the um, Mark Kramer, if I could. It would be made to the planner, um, or okay. um, you, you limit... limit um, uh, I would ask the planner then, does the golf course organization have any other plans for future development that you're aware of? Uh, I'm not sure how accurately I can answer that question, um, but um, I know there has been a number of discussions, uh, even prior to my starting with the uh, the county, um, between the golf course and uh, and the planning department regarding proposals for the land. Um, the lands are designated rural; uh, they're adjacent to a golf course. Um, the county official plan does contemplate state lot residential developments in certain areas that um, uh, that like such as a golf course uh, that have high scenic amenity value and so on uh, and in limited sort of um, areas within the county um, so there's a section of the county official plan a state lot residential or a state residential uh, as a designation in the county official plan. Um, the provisions of that designation would see that um, one, a few things. One, that it be developed through a plan of subdivision. Uh, two, it would be developed comprehensively. So we'd, we'd have a look at, you know, everything in terms of servicing and so on. Um, so, I mean, there has been some general discussions of that nature, but there's been nothing specific to, um, to, to, to a degree that I could offer some certainty that they're, they're coming forward with another application uh, in the future. Um, All right. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to continue this line of thinking. So, so for me, I think it's, it's very pertinent and valid that, that the neighbors, and in, in this case, the neighbor is a corporation or the board of directors at the golf course, and the neighbors that, that live in the area get lots of open dialogue about what the future holds, and 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 uh, certainly the future of, of golf courses, as as eloquently directed to us by Mr. Kramer, was that they're suffering a little. Some of them are suffering a little, and and these these opportunities we've seen Westlinks Golf Course. Uh, bring forward an opportunity, and and, uh, and and it it took some agricultural supporting agricultural land to make that happen, and um, there are other opportunities similar to that. We have seen, Madam Chair, we have seen developers down close to the waterfront look at lands and say these would be good places to allow for for construction of homes as well. So on the on the. Generally speaking, I'm in I'm in favor of, of some development opportunity here, and I look at the I'm looking at an aerial shot now of the of the said lands, and my question back to the planner would be, are are we fully understanding of what those lands are being used for today? The lands that would be subject to this two lot proposal. If the planner so chooses, you can you can involve the applicant in answering the question. 
I, I think that would be fair to involve the applicant at this point because I, I really don't have a sense of what their operational requirements or um, operational needs are. I guess are. more importantly, I'd like to know, it's, it's an agricultural zoned piece of land, but is it a, and when was the last time it functioned as a crop or a livestock piece of property? It, it's zoned open space three, actually. So open space uh, uh, is the existing zoning and agricultural is the proposed zoning. Yeah, yeah, I get the confusion for that. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah, and, and designated rural in the county official plan. So really it's some, some, some bush land, some, some small crop trees, maybe, maybe some larger tree, tree area. Maybe I, maybe I do need to ask if I could direct that question to Sogging and Golf Club members. Yes, I think that would be fair if... Uh, I have one more after that. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, um, Councillor Minaj, the general topography of these two lots, which are going to consist of about uh, 420 feet, if you're old like me, 70 meters, 140 meters on the Dahl side road. Um, the general uh, impression you're going to get upon driving and looking at these lots is that they are weed-infested, abandoned farmland. Um, there are multiple weeds, as, as uh, Mr. Pedwell has already indicated, which has a useful purpose in terms of, of butterflies and birds and, and, and other uh, flora and fauna. At the back portion, there's a gentle rise of what is primarily sand that would uh, rise to about 25 feet above the basic level of, of the front. Um, these lots are, are, are 280 feet deep, roughly, uh, Councillor Minaj. So there might be 50 feet at the back of the lots to contain a mound. Those mounds contain primarily scrub pine trees and, and, uh, and other um, uh, conifers. Uh, the, the land hasn't been farmed per se. Um, I, I don't believe in, in, in quite some time. Um, the last agricultural use of that, I believe, was grassing of, of, of cattle. Um, ironically, it isn't it isn't zoned agricultural now, right. Councillor Minaj. And I think yeah. it's important you remember that yeah. that we're not taking land out of agriculture. We're actually putting it back in. No, 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 no. And and uh, so the open space is the current zoning, and and the, the lots right now uh, have have. I think I'm safe to say I was born and raised on a farm, Councillor Minaj. So I understand farming. And I understand rural life, and I've also lived with a well for 20 years. I, I, you would be very challenged to crop this piece of land or, or to farm it with anything other than, I, I just don't know if it's been invented yet, Councillor Minaj. Yeah. F fair enough and thank you and I appreciate that. So to finish my line of thinking then, um, <laughs> I would like to think that there are more opportunities for, for uh, neighbours to, to move forward and to maintain friendships. And I, I certainly see the value in, in creating these two lots in this location. I do also fully recognize the need, and I'm asking the planner if we can, if we can entertain whatever that takes, some kind of hydro, hydrogeological study. And I, I mean, I get that these things can be expensive, but is there is there a way to say and predicate on 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 this decision? that we, we don't impact, um, I'm not worried about, I, I should be worried for the, for the municipality about law, pending lawsuits in the future and what happens somewhere else. But I think that it's a prudent step to say, maybe this process requires some kind of study that says something along the lines of the water exists at this level, there's lots of it, there isn't enough of it. Some, some rudimentary information as opposed to we, we're grasping at straws and we don't have any information other than uh, eloquent uh, uh, delegations that are saying they know. Uh, I would like something more factual if possible. Thank you. I, I don't disagree. My preference, my preference would be to, um, to establish the principle of use, i.e. the land use designation through support, supporting studies. 
Um, however, the applicant has indicated they're not able to at this time um, because of various reasons. Um, so in bringing this forward, the study requirements are um, conditional or the consent um, that would create the lots um, are conditional on the studies being uh, completed to the satisfaction of uh, county and, and town staff. Um, so that's, you know, not typically how we would proceed with uh, an OPA. However, in this case, if approved, there are those um, safeguards in place, I would say, uh, that would ensure um, the residential uses on, on the properties are viable at the end of the day. Thank you. Councillor Mayer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. One more question for the planner. Uh, would it be at all possible that if these lots are, are get to the approval stage that a condition be placed by on the proponent that uh, that a letter of credit or a bonded amount of money be set aside that in the event that the neighbor neighbor wells are negatively impacted either on quantity or quality of water that there would be money available hosted by the proponent to remediate those situations be it drill a new well or or take uh, corrective actions Uh, that's that's certainly something that we can um, look into and maybe get back to you. I'm not I'm not familiar with uh, a similar instance of of that condition being applied to a sort of rural consent. I mean, for uh, a subdivision and, and something along that lines, it's it's more typical. So, um, short answer: I don't know offhand if that's uh, possible as a condition right now, but uh, I will certainly look into it. Okay, I, I think we'll um, move on in the agenda. I, I'd like to make sure that everybody who has a particular interest in this, this file, ensure that you complete um, the sign-up sheets. I believe they're outside the door. Name, address, um, email address, so that you receive a further notification. This, this meeting tonight was just to collect information. Um, has a, a question that I have for the planner. There's been a couple mentions of these new signs that we've seen around town about um, water protection zones. Um, perhaps you can um, give us a comment in, in the report about um, what those signs actually um, represent because there are some in various locations now. It would be good to know why they're there and what they mean. Um, so thank you very much and I will now invite um, the Deputy Mayor back to the chair. Okay, thank you, Vice Deputy Mayor Huber. So that moves us then on to item 5.2, which is uh, a uh, zoning bylaw amendment re with regard to the Lamont pit. So we'll turn it over to the planner for your report. Thank you. Uh, so this is a zoning bylaw amendment for the uh, Lamont pit. Um, so it, it only encompasses the purple area here, not the entire property. Um, this is the area that is under active, uh, uh, operates as an active aggregate pit right now and is in the process of going through uh, a rehabilitation plan um, through the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. Uh, so there's kind of a mixed bag in terms of uh, surrounding um, uses. Um, currently they're zoned extractive industrial and planned development um, and as, as well as uh, environmental protection within the subject lands. Surrounding land uses include uh, again extractive industrial, um, some agricultural, um, highway commercial and um, I believe mobile home uh, park is the zone. So the proposal is to rezone the lands from extractive industrial, agricultural, and planned development to open space and environmental protection. The proposed amendment will permit a portion of the former 
former Lamont Pitt lands to be redeveloped into a sports field complex. This is a conceptual drawing that was included in the uh, Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry Re Rehabilitation Plan that the town and pit operator uh, submitted to the ministry. Um, it's by no means uh, a final uh, rendering of what's proposed on the lands, but more so uh, provides some context as to what could fit on the lands uh, in terms of sports fields. So in consultation with the Saugeen Valley um, Conservation Authority, um, they indicated um, portions of the land are, um, are subject to updated mapping. And typically when the SVCA uh, provides uh, updated ma mapping in their comment letters, we uh, recommend um, including that through the, uh, the forthcoming amendment. Um, so that um, it doesn't really impact the... Uh, the sports field area. I think there's a minor impact to one of one or two of the ballparks. Uh, they could um, easily be shifted over. So the recommendation would be to implement those um, the the revised EP zone. Uh, no public comments were received um, for this circulation prior to uh, the report being submitted. Um, and and just in terms of uh, a summary, I guess. Um, the proposal is to rezone from extractive industrial, agricultural, and plan development to open space and EP implementing the uh, the EP zone. The town's um, the town's official plan um, designation extractive uh, industrial permits rehabilitated lands to um, be used for such things as open space uses, uh, sports fields, etc., without an official plan amendment. Hence, the reason for just the zoning bylaw amendment. Going forward, if the remainder of the lands are to be redeveloped, um, an official plan amendment would be likely. Um, so that's that's pretty much it in summary. Um, leave it there. Thank you, Dan. First, we'll ask uh, members of the committee if you have questions for clarification with regard to the planner's report. We'll start with Councillor Dave Mayette. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, my question is, uh, if this uh, zoning goes through, we'll have a, a section that is OP and environmental protection, and which is what is being proposed here. Uh, the other uh, 80 or so acres that is attached to the, the property, is it currently zoned ag? Uh, yes, it looks like it's zoned. Oh, there's a, some extraction there too. Okay. Yeah, uh, extraction and EP. Yeah. Okay. So it would still be a, a bit of a patchwork of, uh, of different zoning. Yes, and plan development. Sorry. Yes. So there it is. There, plan development, uh, extractive, industrial, egg, and then EP. All the tag is that little triangle down. That's there? right. Yes. Oh. Yep. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Okay, are there any further questions for clarification? Then we'll move on to the public uh, input portion of the meeting. And I, we have, uh, yep, go ahead, uh, Joan, if you want to go first. Make sure when you uh, come up to the microphone to state your name for the record. Joan Johnson, from the Nile property, right across the road. I didn't come prepared to say anything. But I am concerned what difference it's going to make to our property. We have 92 acres across road and we farm it. I would like to be informed, kept up, and not by internet. I don't have internet and I'm not getting it. My freedom. We also have land in the on the south side. In all of seven. So we're going to be hit by both what happens to that golf course and what happens to this. Spend a lot of money and go without a lot of things to get this. I'm interested in what is going to be a lot of um, people. Or Joan, could you, Joan, could you just uh, speak into the microphone? It's, we're just having a little trouble hearing you. Thank you. So I am concerned on what is going to happen and what you're going to change and how much more you're going to build. So 
and be too late to talk soon, so I am having it now so that I'm kept well informed. Okay? Thank you very much, and of course, if you do want to have more information, make sure to sign the sheets on the outside of the room Pardon? so that if you're looking for, if you want to be kept up to date, make sure to, make sure to sign that sheet. But the old, every time I ask things, they say, well, you can look on internet. So nobody informs me of anything anymore. So I miss a lot. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Johnson. Further uh, comments uh, from members of the public? Are there any further comments from any members of the public? I don't see any. Okay. Well, that uh, will conclude then the uh, public input uh, portion then. And uh, are there any other comments from committee members? Uh, the Vice Deputy Mayor. Two questions, one for the planner and, and one through you to uh, the CAO. Um, I am curious to know, um, do, you have a, do you have an indication in your notes of, of when you did mail out notices um, specific to this application? Um, it's, you know, I, I just, I'm surprised that there wasn't any comments, positive or negative, because, you know, it certainly is an interesting application. And, and did you send them, um, you know, within the, the radius, or did you extend a little bit further because of the distances involved between properties in that part of town? So, yes, I do have those details. The notice was sent on July 20th. Uh, it was sent by mail. And it was circulated to all residents uh, abutting the entire property within 120 meters of that um, orange boundary. So it, it did capture quite quite a number of residents. I think it was one of our larger uh, mail, mailings. Um, and, and I, too, was um, somewhat surprised that we, we didn't get a, a greater response through the mailings. Thank you. And, and through you to the CAO, um, you know, I realize this is just a public meeting about the zoning, but... Do you have a sense of, of um, can you suggest any kind of community consultation that will flow um, over the next you know, three, six months um, concerning this, this potential development? Uh, yes, uh, through you, Deputy Mayor. Um, specifically, we will be doing a lot of uh, consultation with the sports organizations in town to uh, further develop that portion of, of the property and make sure that we're building the uh, appropriate sports fields and we'll be using the recreation master plan. Uh, in terms of any other public consultation, we'll just be using uh, this process to do that. We're not planning anything extraordinary. Um, I believe we did send out a letter to uh, neighboring residents early on, uh, right after uh, the town purchased the property, advising them of, of the timing. And we do have a signed agreement with the, the, uh, the person that currently farming the property and, and uh, we've worked directly with him. Looks like we have one more gentleman who would like to make a comment, sir. My name is Brian Miller and I live on 316 Concession 6. And I don't know how they sent those letters out, but I got mine on the 15th of August, two days after I could say anything. So I don't know where they went in between, but I didn't get it. I got the first letter you're talking about where they suggested it. I did receive that. But by the time I got my letter, I couldn't appeal or put in anything. So it was the 15th. And it was dated that I, after the 13th, they weren't able to do anything. So if everybody else got there's the same way, that's why there's nobody here. Because the people I talk to in the neighborhood aren't really happy about it. We're not happy about the traffic it's going to create. Um, I've been in development all my life. Parks create crime. Bottom line, kids hangouts. And I've developed all across Canada. I've seen it many, many times. So I have a major concern because I bought where I am because of the quietness. Just that bridge alone created my road to turn into a freeway. That you, you better watch when you walk to the mailbox. You're going to get run over. Because cars aren't doing 80 in a 40. They're doing 100 plus. And you put that park there, it's going to get worse. Guaranteed. I've seen it 100 times. I can show you pictures of guys doing burnouts in parks. That's what parks do. So unless you have a compound, then you're going to lock it up and have it secured. There's going to be problems with it because there's nobody out there. Quiet. No other houses there. Nobody watched them. 
perfect place for people to go. That's my concern. Thank you very much. Uh, were there other questions for follow-up from uh, members of the committee? Of course, just uh, to be clear with uh, everyone that uh, no decisions can be made here this evening, that uh, this will come back to uh, uh, the committee um, at a subsequent date and then to council uh, thereafter. So, uh, so there's more opportunity to uh, make, your, uh, make your thoughts and uh, comments heard uh, going forward. Um, and uh, we'd certainly encourage you to do that. So if there's nothing further, uh, then um, so there is this uh, the recommendation that staff provide a report regarding the public meeting and a recommendation regarding the applications at a subsequent meeting. Uh, just so we can get it all in favor of that. Yes. Oh, sorry, Neil, Councilor Minaj, pardon me. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Charbonneau. Luke, I would like to uh, suggest that maybe we extend an, an opportunity for people, residents residents in the area then that are suggesting that they haven't had due, due a course and, and opportunity to voice their concerns, uh, recognizing that that last speaker, and I forgot names, so I apologize, but uh, that, that he is on the record by speaking tonight, but maybe uh, with more, more time, if there, is a, if there is a larger contingent of residents that wish they had had a similar opportunity, maybe we should be offering that. Okay. There will be, as we said, more opportunities and more decision points uh, to come, and we certainly encourage people to uh, participate in the process. And again, sign sign-up sheets so you are aware of those decision-making dates and uh, are able to participate. Um, so yeah, so that's the uh, the recommendation uh, that um, staff provide a report regarding the public meeting and a recommendation regarding the applications at a subsequent meeting. All in favor of that recommendation? That's carried. So that moves us then on to item 5.3, uh, Town of Saugeen Shores Zoning Bylaw Amendments. Uh, and uh, there is a decision related to this one, uh, but we'll begin with uh, the planner's report. And who has this one, Tessa? Yes, thank you. Um, so yes, as mentioned, this is um, a report for a public meeting. Um, so we're open to hearing comments, but there is a uh, draft bylaw um, that has also been included as part of this report. Um, so I, I apologize, there's no um, presentation for this uh, report. It just really didn't lend itself to, to a slideshow um, being a housekeeping amendment. Uh, so the proposed amendments apply to a number of areas within the settlement boundary of the town of Sogging Shores. And on the recommendation of the town and the agreement of the county, this report is being presented directly for recommendation. So the application proposes to amend the zoning bylaw to address some persistent issues and discrepancies that have been identified, provide new regulation for small scale office uses, food trucks and temporary second dwellings, and provide updated mapping for t um, two properties or, or areas. Um, so this application is consistent with the PPS, it conforms to the Bruce County official plan and the Sogging Shores official plan and the intent and purpose of the local zoning bylaw. So, I'll just go through um, the various um, uh, updates that are being proposed. And I will note that um, most of the comments that were provided in the report do come from Sogging Shores staff. And we've just reviewed them and, and added a few comments here and there and are, are in agreement um, uh, with what, what town staff provided in terms of this. And I do believe that um, council has, has heard about these amendments and is, is generally familiar with what's being proposed in the housekeeping. Uh, so the first item being proposed has to do with provisions for driveways. So during the last round of zoning amendments, staff wished to include a provision to include 50% of the area of the front yard on residential lots to be devoted to parking. Uh, this would align with the amendment to approve, approve to allow a maximum driveway width of 50% of the lot frontage. Uh, so currently the um, maximum area of a front yard allowed to be permitted uh, for parking is 40 and this would add it to 50 so it just brings all, that all in line so those, those two provisions are in line with each other. For item number two, a temporary second dwelling on the lot. So in the past, there's been times where a landowner wishes to construct a dwelling on a property and continue to occupy the existing dwelling until the new one is complete, kind of have a base um, for that construction. Uh, this has been done through a temporary use zoning bylaw in the past. Now staff have proposed to allow for a second dwelling on 
any land within the town provided lawfully ex a lawfully existing dwelling is on the lot, and such existing dwelling is to be removed upon the completion of a new dwelling. Uh, so this is generally happening on large lots where there's, there's room to allow two dwellings at any one time. Uh, such allowance would be regulated by an agreement with the CBO and the landowner to ensure that the dwelling is removed in a timely manner. And um, just to clarify, despite uh, the regulation applying to any land within the town, the new dwelling would still need to comply to the particular zoning bylaw for that lot. So it would still be subject to all the zoning provisions or would need to apply for an amendment in order to allow for any sorts of change um, to that. Item three um, has to do with the exterior side setback in the R2 zone. Um, so this is basically just to match the R2, uh, R2 zoning with the R1 zoning for the exterior side yard setback. Um, so the R1, in the R1 it was reduced to 4.5 meters. Um, this would also reduce it to 4.5 meters in the R2 zone which would provide a more consistent application of zone provisions for the majority of properties in town. Um, so single detached dwellings, semi-detached dwellings, and duplexes would have similar zoning provisions. Uh, this should have no effect on compatibility with housing types uh, within existing or planned neighborhoods. Item four is lot coverage in the R3 and R4 zones. Um, so with higher density residential demand um, growing in the community, we've observed a number of issues uh, with some of these higher density lots. Uh, the town zoning bylaw has not been adequately allowing for lot coverage issues to be efficiently addressed, uh, particularly with, with townhomes. So every single townhouse development um, that has been brought forward has required the developer to amend the lot covered provisions in the town's zoning bylaw, and every application has been approved. So there is an issue here. Um, this is due to the a function of how interior lots are designed within um, the townhome um, unit, so they don't have a side yard, so they can, can never really meet that minimum lot coverage coverage. Uh, so the setbacks are still met, uh, but the interior lots um, have a higher coverage than is allowed. So staff proposed to increase the permitted lot coverage from 35% to 50%, as this will allow for more flexibility in housing design to meet housing needs for all ages and in environments typically found in the settlement area. Uh, this 50% would be applied to each lot as a maximum, not as a coverage requirement. Um, so it's anticipated that the end units would sell a lower coverage than that 50% as is kind of the typical design of a townhome. But those interior units would now meet the bylaw. Uh, item five allows for provisions for uh, food trucks in the commercial core. So pursuant to council's directions to better regulate food trucks in the commercial core, staff proposed a new provision in this uh, core commercial zone, which outlines the land use requirements for obtaining a license. For the purpose of amending the zoning bylaw, uh, staff proposed that food trucks are only permitted in the core commercial zone on lots that do not have any vacancies, uh, must not occupy more than 25 square meters, including any space for serving, lineup, signage, etc and are allowed for special events. And town staff noted that further, further regulations uh, would need to be included in an update to the business license bylaw. And then item six is new uses in the institutional zone. Uh, so as we know, the Bruce Power MCR project is ramping up and businesses have indicated their difficulty in, attorney, in obtaining office space. Um, in Soggy Shores. So there is new office space kind of coming down the pipeline, but a lot of it hasn't yet been constructed to meet demand. So staff have proposed uh, the inclusion to permit limited small scale office uh, spaces, so rental space um, in the institutional zone, uh, and have noted that there is some availability in municipally owned buildings that could be converted to office space to meet this um, kind of need in this moment. Uh, in terms of the two mapping updates, I'll just go over those really quickly. So um, the one is for lands along uh, Fenton Drive from 47 to 59 Fenton Drive. So these lots have been connected to full municipal services. And so the zoning can be updated to reflect that. So they no longer require any special provisions for your septic placement. And then the second one is 477 Bruce Road 25. So there was just a, an error um, when this um, R170 zoning was originally applied and it didn't accurately reflect the lands devoted to the existing resi residential use. So this is just an error that's being corrected to, to show that the R170 zone encompasses um, the residential use on that, on that property and, and all the required setbacks. So just in terms of um, what we've received in terms of comments, um, we 
didn't receive um, too many comments from agencies. Uh, the Sunny Valley Conservation Authority asked for clarification on the any lands um, element of the second temporary dwelling. And so I think I've, I've explained that it would still need to meet the bylaws so it wouldn't be included in, in EP lands um, without any kind of amendment uh, to that. Uh, there are no public comments received on uh, the housekeeping. And so with that, I do recommend that the housekeeping be approved and uh, the bylaw forwarded to council for adoption. Thank you very much, uh, Tessa. So uh, first we'll turn it over to the committee for questions of clarification. Councillor Matheson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and through you. Um, item five, will that be grandfathered in case we do have any food uh, vehicles that are already within the core commercial? As far as I know, there hasn't been any discussion about that, but um, about grandfathering in, so I'd have to check with Soggy and Shore staff. Um, if, I don't know if there is any existing issues that would need to be addressed. It certainly, they could qualify as sort of grandfathered if they could qualify for a license, but they'd have to demonstrate application of both the legal nonconforming provisions of the Act and compliance with the business licensing bylaw of the town. The vice deputy mayor. Through you, um, perhaps to the to the clerk or um, to the uh, director of development services. Are we confident that the language in in item five um, represents the 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 intent? And what I'm getting at is um, number C says for the purposes of special events. Um, is it defined in the bylaw that special events are? activities on public property or would this also include a promotional activity put on by a business which could be considered a special event and I have a, another one so does special events um, capture more than just um, events on public property through you deputy mayor the special events are are directed towards the public events that are approved by the town of Saugeen Shores and that'll be coming forward in a business licensing amendment so we're hoping to have that to you on Monday night next Monday night okay and the other one um, are only permitted in the commercial core zone on lots that do not have any vacancies um, what I understand that to mean is um, that the lot has to have an, an act have a, a building a structure on it and have a, a business active in that am I interpreting that correctly that is correct now we did have a conversation before the meeting among staff um, that we may need to clarify that where it says that do not have any vacancies and we may want to say um, non-residential so basically there cannot be any commercial vacancies on the property so if you have a core commercial you have a, a commercial building and it has a residential component we're not meaning that to be the residential component of it having any vacancies I could ask it in a different way if there's a building there but there's not a building or not a business operating in the building does that enable a food truck to be there the intent is that the building would be um, occupied it would not be vacant further questions for clarification I would just follow up on that question uh, to the clerk uh, so does this mean uh, that um, vacancies that that you know a building can be occupied and then become unoccupied uh, and so um, would would therefore the the avail availability for any property to have a food truck fluctuate and and I guess the decision as to whether it's it meets the zoning would be made every year at the license at the moment of licensing is that how it would work in response to your question yes at the time of licensing it would be determined whether it meets the occupancy standards for the existing buildings okay oh yep uh, council rich thank you to you um, <clears throat> mr. chair um, so as opposed to kind of talking around it in Southampton there's a max milk and there's a food truck out front does that get to stay or does it go through you deputy mayor I think what was explained from the planner was that if at the time that the um, 
or through Jay, sorry. If the business, the food truck, is currently operating in accordance with the business licensing bylaw and the zone provisions, and it continues to operate and just needs the business license to be extended into the next year, it would be considered legal non-complying, and it could continue. Well, there's nothing further from committee members. We'll open it up to members of the public. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak to uh, any of these zoning bylaw amendments contained in the uh, in this report. I'll ask again, are there any members of the public who wish to speak to this report? I don't see any, so uh, we can then move on to the recommendation from the planner, and I'll read the recommendation. It's recommended that the zoning bylaw amendment Z40 18.46 uh, as a housekeeping update for the comprehensive zoning bylaw 75 2006 be approved and the necessary bylaw be forwarded to council for adoption. Are there any questions or comments to that recommendation? Seeing none, all in favor. That's carried. Thank you very much. So that takes us to the final public meeting, uh, which is uh, with regard to a zoning bylaw amendment application by Union Building Corporation of Canada, Unifor. And we'll turn it over to the uh, planner for the report. Okay, thank you. Um, so this zoning bylaw amendment pertains to, uh, nope, wrong, I think this is the wrong slide deck. There's two uniforms tonight. Um, this is for 44, 18, 44. Okay, great. Okay, so this uh, zoning bylaw amendment pertains to a small section of land uh, on the Unifor campus. Uh, proposed to be rezoned to environmental protection special. So that would be a special provision for a uh, non-enclosed uh, roof structure over top of the stairs. The stairs have existing uh, legal non-conforming status and therefore a building permit uh, can be obtained for uh, the reconstruction of the stairs. And here's a, here's a map of the proposed zoning. So it, it more or less follows the, the width of the trail and sta existing stair structure, uh, seven, seven meters wide. Um, and here's a rendering of the uh, stair, proposed stair structure. Um, so the applicant has indicated that the existing stairs are a slip and fall hazard. Uh, be, uh, because of uh, they're exposed to inclement weather um, and and so on, so they're proposing to um, to cover the stairs. They lead from the upper parking area down to the main complex uh, where where people would stay. So um, they they'd often have their luggage in tow. So there's also a, a, a luggage ramp proposed to go alongside this, and, and it would all be enclosed in a uh, sorry, all be covered by a non-enclosed uh, roof structure. Here's a, here's a photo of the existing stairs. I believe they're made out of some sort of flagstone um, material, possibly. So they, they do to get quite slippery, uh, from what I understand. Um, the town of Sogging Shores indicated no objection, uh, and the SVCA also uh, indicated the, the amendment is acceptable. Uh, we did get one email inquiry or written comments. Um, they were more sort of general questions about the application, and, and I don't think there are any specific objections related to this application, although they, they did note uh, some other uh, development on the property. Um, so to recap, uh, the purpose is to rezone the lands from EP to EPX, uh, or sorry, EP special, I think the number is 33. The special provision would allow the roof to structure. Um, the stairs, the existing stairs are in legal non-conforming use. Um, therefore, the amendment only applies to the roof structure. Um, subject to consideration of objections raised at the public meeting, it's my recommendation that this zoning bylaw amendment be approved. Um, 
and uh, the necessary uh, bylaw be forwarded to council for adoption. Thank you, Daniel. So I'll ask if any member of the committee has any questions for clarification. Yes, uh, I have one just speaking uh, broadly, not just with regard to this application, but more generally. Um, this seems like kind of a nitpicky uh, zoning bylaw amendment. I mean, uh, to have to amend the zoning bylaw to cover a set of stairs that are already there, uh, it just seems like a like if we're is this a situation that we can avoid in the future I, where, where um, infrastructure like this that's already in existence, it's already been there for many, many years, could uh, be, somebody could build a roof. I mean, I, I could, you need building permits, obviously, but, but, uh, but zoning bylaw amendments, it just seems like a bit much. Am I, what do you think about that? <laughs> yeah, no, I don't disagree. Uh, it, it does seem like a, a somewhat onerous process to, to go through. Um, so the trigger, um, the trigger in this instance is when the applicant um, went forward for a building, um, building permit and um, in reviewing the permitted uses on um, within that zone, it was determined that this didn't fit in as a permitted use. And so certainly there could be some examination of what uses are permitted within, um, within various zones to, to include these uh, or I guess this would be considered maybe an enlargement or um, an expansion of an existing structure to some degree. Um, but um, I, I think we'd have to deal with that through the uses, the permitted uses. Maybe then it's an opportunity uh, at the next opportunity when we're looking at the zoning bylaw uh, or potentially a group of amendments to the zoning bylaw to look at how we can accomplish, uh, allow smaller changes to take place without uh, um, requiring these major uh, kind of processes, uh, I guess would be my comment directed at staff. Um, if there's nothing further from the committee, then I'll ask members of the public if they have uh, any uh, comments. Yes, good evening. My name's Ron Davidson. I'm a planning consultant uh, representing Unifor. Uh, with me here tonight are are Jim Elliott and Jeff Schnarr from uh, Unifor. Yeah, this is really a, a simple matter. Um, it's, uh, and it's really about health and safety. We've got a set of steps. They are broken. Dan's picture didn't show the, uh, the pylon that was covering uh, one of the broken steps. Um, so they, they want to replace the steps and at the same time put a roof over top. Um, it is in the hazard zone, but the Conservation Authority is, has said they have no concerns whatsoever with, uh, with putting the steps over it. Um, that's all I have to say other than I would respectfully uh, request that you follow your planner's advice and actually approve this tonight so Unifor can move forward in fixing the steps and putting the, uh, putting the overhead up. Thanks. Thank you. Are there further uh, comments from members of the public? I don't see any further comments from members of the public, so we will... And, we're, and we, everything's coming up roses here. The lights are coming back on and everything. Uh, so we'll go to the recommendation. Find the recommendation. So I uh, have a recommendation that zoning bylaw amendment Z4418.44 be approved and that Council of the Town of Saugeen Shores adopt the draft bylaw attached. Any questions or comments to the recommendation? Seeing none, all in favor? Carried. So then that takes us on to uh, item six, Committee of the Whole. We're moving now into Committee of the Whole uh, and 6.1 delegations. And we have two delegations on this evening. And the first delegation is from Greg Schmaltz, the president of the Port Elgin and Soggy and Beachers organization. And with regard to the uniform parking lot, Mr. Schmaltz.
Mr. Smoltz, would you just there? Thank you. Residents living in this immediate area express concerns on this proposal besides the fact that the proposed use is not consistent with the intended uses described in Port Alcan's official plan and zoning bylaw for this land. I read the consultant's report and I'd just like to comment that any resentment that he could be referring to is based upon a proponent going forward without due process and any permits. The other comment we have on the, on the approval that is not within the Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority's suggested 15 meter setback uh, to a hazard, despite the fact that it's been approved by Saugeen Valley. Tonight we will be submitting the results of a petition circulated in the immediate area north of County Road 25 to the Shipley, Seaford, and Goebbels Place residents. The petition was met with virtually unanimous acceptance by eligible voting residents. We have 83, plus myself and my wife is 85, residents who have put their names and signatures to this petition. Uh, I would point out that there's approximately four vacant homes that when we surveyed, two were absent, and one had a conflict, and two were indifferent. So effectively, it's unanimous opposition in the neighborhood uh, to this proposal. And if there was a provision in the planning process to take democracy of the people, their wishes into effect, this project would not go forward. Our major concerns, as we outlined earlier, are walking, biking, and car safety, as there are no sidewalks on this so busy link to the neighborhood. The high volume of existing vehicle use and congestion. The existing parking lot was an illegal use of this residential house lot. And doubling its size from four to eight cars and then offering electric car charging services, all of which were not contemplated nor approved for in the originally intended residential use of this site will only increase traffic in this highly congested area. All local residents must use the single entry exit way to the neighborhood and mail pickup. You know, for office staff, maintenance staff, vehicles, visitor vehicles, and tour buses all use the main gate entry slash parking lot across from the proposed parking lot for pulling up, unloading, and parking. A uniform pedestrian crosswalk across Shipley at their proposed parking lot location serves as the crosswalk to the beach or up to the 300 hotel guests. The sole neighborhood mailbox newspaper pickup is located on this site. And now this stretch of Shipley Avenue has been officially signed and designated as a Great Lakes waterfront trail that will connect the new County Road 25 beach to Highway 21 cycling pedestrian path a mere few meters away. Unifor already has a huge parking lot that has just been newly opened and built with Saugeen Valley approval, which is much better suited to staff and visitor parking, to tour bus unloading and unloading, and to car charging stations than this small residential lot located on a busy neighborhood artery. One of our members went out and counted personally over 400 existing parking spaces. So the need for this is 100% convenience. And that's been the historical use of this site. Pull off the road, hop out of your car, run across to the main door. So the intended use as stated, or the purpose as stated, is to supply additional parking for the townhouse wing going down to the water, one would have to question how did that survive all these years without these additional eight parking spaces. The proposed parking lot development and car charging service is not an intended nor recommended use of an EH property. Its underground electrical components buried in a proven floodplain in a wooded area is a potential danger and fire hazard. Unifor themselves have not demonstrated an absolute operational need for this parking lot and its charging stations to be located there, unduly adding to risks as outlined above. We are requesting that permission for this development be denied and the property remediated to its original natural state 
or sold to the municipality and redeveloped as a parkette. As originally suggested, we believe the highest and best use for this land would be for it to be used as part of the Great Lakes waterfront trail system. It could be transformed easily into a pedestrian, cyclist-friendly mini parkette, complete with drinking water fountain, bike stands, picnic tables, and stream view bench seating. In this way, it would function as a rest of stop and be a contributing factor in supporting the use of Shipley Avenue as part of the new County Road 25 Master Plan and Great Lakes Waterfront Trail pedestrian slash cycling path system. The Beecher's organization will look seriously at funding, at fundraising for this, and building this mini parkette. I'd like to thank you uh, for your consideration, and we hope that you will uh, will see our point of view that this is truly a convenience option, and it's, there's no there's no need for it. Thank you, Mr. Schmaltz. Are there any questions from members of the committee for Mr. Schmaltz? Being none, thank you. Uh, so our second uh, deputation is Mr. Ron Davidson, the planner for Unifor, Mr. Davidson. Yes, good evening again. I, I guess I forgot the first time to also tell you how great it's been standing before you guys for the last few years. Um, if we're uh, so, I guess if we're doing uh, music quotes tonight, yes, Greg's right. Uh, you can't always get what you want, but uh, to continue with that song, I believe it goes: if you uh, you try, sometime you'll find you get what you need. So we're hoping we we get what we need here tonight. Um, just a few comments that uh, to follow up from the last public meeting. Um, there were a lot of concerns, um, and I put those uh, my responses that were, um, I, I got a lot of assistance from, from the folks at Unifor in, in designing a letter dated June 28th back to the county planner. And I think through your clerk, Linda, she has forwarded that on to you. Uh, Greg made mention of the fact uh, at the onset there of, a, of my letter, which talks about some resentment towards Unifor. Um, I think that's the case. I, I, I was, I've never worked for them before, but I think a lot of this stems from um, probably the, the uh, wind turbine that uh, did not go over very well a number of years ago. I, I really hope council doesn't share this feeling of resentment. And, and they, they do understand the importance of Unifor in the community. As you're quite aware, Unifor employs over 100 people from the Port Elgin area, which makes it one of the largest employers in the town and the county. Unifor contributes largely to the Saugeen Shores tax base by paying a, about a quarter of a million dollars in property taxes annually. Also, the Family Education Centre brings a significant amount of people to the area uh, from elsewhere every year, most of which are union members and affiliates, and these people spend money in the community. And in addition, their sports fields and classrooms are open to the general public. Uh, but notwithstanding this, the importance of Unifor in Saugeen Shores and in Bruce County doesn't have any bearing on the planning merits of the development application. And being a planner, I probably didn't need to mention that, but we did think it was important just to sort of set the stage. Um, so with regard to the, the planning issues, uh, please note that the engineered site plan has been accepted by the Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority, and as such, a permit from the, for the proposed parking lot with permeable pavers and related excavation, filling, and grading has been issued by the SVCA. Their comments raised at the last meeting regarding the impact on the natural environment they will be negligible, that, those aren't my words, those are coming from the Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority, uh, a letter that they sent to the county prior to the last public meeting. The natural heritage features that were taken into consideration according to the Conservation Authority were the significant woodlands, the fish habitat of the stream in Lake Huron, and significant wildlife habitat. There was a comment made about clear cutting. Unifor did not clear cut a forested area to facilitate the parking lot. Three pine trees were removed from along the north side of the lot. One was dead and the other two were not healthy. Also, a few ash trees that were infected, infected by ash borer were removed from the west end of the site. Um, the Shipley Avenue parking area was required not only because additional parking was needed on the property, but also to allow for uniform, Unifor's continued mandate to support sustainability and the reduction of greenhouse gases by installing electric vehicle charging stations to support the growing number of gas electric hybrid vehicles. Um, Greg has his opinion about the need for this. Uh, Unifor has theirs. Uh, 
they're telling me that this, this parking area will be used for the people in the cove uh, down below. Um, but they're, that's what they're saying. Uh, so there, there is a demonstrated need. Uh, the parking, there was a comment uh, last meeting about the parking lot being a sea of asphalt. Uh, it's not that big. It, uh, it won't be a sea of asphalt, nor will it conflict with the landscaping efforts in the, uh, of other properties in the area. That too was a concern. The parking area will involve permeable pavers known as turf stone, which allow vegetation to thrive and it creates a lush appearance of green space because of its 40% open design, allowing grass to grow through, the preserve, uh, through preserving a vegetative appearance. And I did, uh, I don't know if council has my, uh, has my letter, but there is an illustration provided in my letter that shows exactly what I'm talking about. Turf stone is ideal for overflow traffic areas requiring solid traction and erosion control. It allows rainwater to gradually be filtered back into the soil naturally, resulting in the control and stabilization of the surrounding soils, reducing runoff while creating a highly unique hardscape design that works in harmony with nature. Also, it blends perfectly with the surrounding landscape as it is uh, simple, it, as it's a simple open weave design and allows for breathable pavement, making it environmentally friendly alternative to heat producing concrete or asphalt by reducing urban heat island effect, recharging groundwater sources and filtering stormwater to reduce transportation pollutions. Also, it's worth noting here that the front portion of the, of the parking lot will only be 6.35 meters wide. Whereas the existing parking lot is considerably wider at the frontage, uh, it's the, the entrance will now be reduced in width and the remainder of the lands abutting Shipley Avenue will be landscaped. The perimeter of the parking area will be supplemented with drought resistant shrubs to further enhance an already attractive uh, harmonious appearance. There are comments about uh, light pollution. Well, there will be two light standards constructed and they will be dark sky compliant. No light will be cast on adjacent properties. Regarding traffic, um, big difference of opinions, I suppose, between the neighbours and, and, and myself. A uh, parking lot will generate very little traffic. It's going to accommodate eight parking spaces. Um, uh, and, and all vehicular traffic that is generated uh, will only traverse a very small section of of Shipley Avenue and that being the from the intersection to the parking lot so it's a very small area. An eight space parking lot does not create traffic problems in fact it does the exact opposite it gets parking off the street. It's important to note that this, this parking lot is a is your traditional parking lot people don't pull in and back out if they pull in there's a maneuvering aisle they'll turn around and drive straight out so that should uh, mitigate any possible concerns with regard to uh, traffic issues the parking lot will be safe. Unifor did, uh, changing gears here, Unifor did not, contrary to what some, some people have said, install electric conduit for the charging stations without a permit, but rather simply uncovered the electrical conduit, the conduit that remained in the ground when the house and the property was removed. So they didn't add anything. To be clear, a permit has not been sought and no electrical work has been carried out in that location. Once the official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment are approved, hopefully, Unifor will contact the Electrical Safety Authority, ESA, and submit a proposal for the automobile charging stations. Uh, the ESA will review the proposal and likely visit the, visit the site to discuss potential hazards and suggest modifications to the proposal if required. The charges, chargers will be mounted on poles approximately 1.2 meters above the height of Shipley Avenue. So flooding will not be an issue. Um, also, with regard to uh, archaeological assessment, as requested by the deputy mayor at the last public meeting, I believe your words were, "Please don't come back with an archaeological without an archaeological assessment." Uh, Amic Archaeological uh, Office has conducted an archaeological assessment, and they found nothing on the site. Uh, lastly, uh, Unifor will not be conveying this parcel of land to the town for park purposes. Uh, the residential suites located on the lower lands adequate parking and therefore Unifor needs this small area to accommodate a few extra vehicles. Hopefully Council will view count, uh, Unifor's efforts to provide additional parking in this area as a positive development. And I conclude by respectfully requesting that you follow the request or the recommendation of your own planning department and approve the requested official plan amendment. And zoning. Thank you uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you Mr. Davidson. Are there any questions for Mr. Davidson before he leaves the podium? 
Uh, Councillor Minaj. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Yes, uh, um, <laughs> so, Ron, uh, as you know, I sat with you while you presented for, for two days at the OMB hearing on 510 Market Street. So I, I respect uh, your abilities and, and concerns. So I set myself up here thinking that if, in fact, we uh, end up voting this down, we're going to end up at a OMB-style hearing in the future or an LPAT tribunal. So I'm going to ask you some questions here so that I can, uh, so I can better maneuver what happens at the next LPAT tribunal, if you don't mind. Go ahead. I'll do my best to answer it. So I'm sure you will. So do you believe this development request is legal non-conforming? Do I believe that the existing uh, parking lot is, is, a, is a legal use? No, no, no. Well, that, so if I could, please, Mr. Deputy Mayor, what existing parking? This is an existing residential lot, is it not? Sure. Oh, I just, sorry, I was being smart. I would like to be, I'd like to be clear that you understand is there a difference? Is this an existing residential lot? Or do you believe this is a legal non-conforming parking lot? Okay, if I may. So it, it exists in the fact that it's been there for 11 or 12 years. Is it, I'm asking myself, is it a legal non-conforming use? And the answer is likely not. Uh, if it doesn't conform to the zoning bylaw, then. It's uh, an illegal use then. It's sure. A, it's yeah. currently an yes. illegal use. And, and that is why we're here. Uh, okay. We are, so, just to be clear, through you, Mr. Mayor, or Deputy Mayor, we did not, we're not making an application for an extension of a legal non-conforming use. We're making an application for rezoning to permit a parking lot. Yeah, let's just uh, focus the uh, comments and questions on the application before us uh, and not uh, on, on um, actions which may come after this process, if that's possible. I understand what you're asking. So there was a comment made um, that the lower level waterfront residences uh, require additional parking. Was, is that, can you, t can you define how many residences there are, how many people would be expected in those residences and what the existing parking lot uh, requirements have been for the past 20, 30 years for those residents? No, I can't. M Mr. Deputy Mayor, if, if you want somebody else from Unifor to attempt to answer that question, um, let me know. I'm, I'm asking it, Mr. Deputy Mayor, because it's, it's context. It's, it's, we're having a, a planner state at this forum in our, in our council committee of the whole that it's necessary for this parking lot to be developed because there is insufficient parking spaces on a development that stood for almost 30 years, as best of my knowledge. I'll allow somebody from, from Unifor to speak to it, but I would just say that we're, we've moved past the public meeting stage on this, so I don't want to get into a situation where we're having a lot of people uh, asking questions in the audience. But if, if Mr. Davidson, if there's somebody uh, here in the audience who you feel can answer that question, by all sure. means, uh, I guess what I will say is when I have a client approach me and tells me, tell me they need a parking lot uh, because they need the parking, I don't question their motive. I, and I, okay, so I don't know when the right time to ask these questions are. The planner is, is telling us that these are all the facets and, and this is everything that's included in the proposal, and yet this is the this is not the time to, to speak to him about this. You want to move into the next phase and have council do that? I might just point out we have a report coming up immediately after this on the agenda. The planner is prepared to speak to the report. And perhaps that would be the opportunity to ask questions. I'll hold back. Thank you. Okay. Are there any further comments? Uh, we'll go out of quite a few going here. I'll start with Councillor Rich and work my way down. Thank you. Through you, Mr. <clears throat> Deputy Mayor. Um, so, in a lot of ways, it looks like a great parking lot, um, and uh, there's you guys pay a lot of taxes, and you're good community members. I, I accept that, um, but would you? I would. I would tend to think that you're having some issues with your neighbors currently. That that right now the relationship between Unifor and the neighborhood around there is not overly good, and there's an opportunity here for Unifor to. Um, throw it an olive branch to try and kind of make amends, to try and heal that relationship 
But instead of doing so, you're trying to get four more parking spaces in the face of what um, the people in the neighborhood don't want. It, would, I, would you say that that's kind of a factual depiction of the situation? I would say that the neighbors, it's fair uh, statement saying the neighbors do not want to see a parking lot. And the relationship with the neighborhood is not currently all that great. By the sounds of it, again, I'm, I was not involved uh, years ago, but again, I'm, I'm, I think it's safe to assume a lot of this stems back from uh, the uh, a wind turbine issue that was dealt with by the Ontario Municipal Board. Agreed. But there's a real opportunity here to try and make amends with the neighborhood. All you're really gaining is four parking spots. I suppose you know. I I I, my, I don't want to sit here and, and argue with a, with a council member. I guess my only comment would be, they're making they're doing a mighty fine job in putting this parking lot, uh, building a, a very small parking lot in the efforts that they're going to. Um, suffice it to say, maybe it's going to be the nicest parking lot you're going to have in in the area. It's from an environmentally perspective, environmentally sensitive perspective. Okay, uh, Councillor Mike Myatt. Thank you, Mr. Luke. Um, just comment through you to uh, Mr. Davids, and I, I, I was a little, little disappointed, Mr. Davids. I expected more from you. I, I, uh, Mr. Smalt stood up, talked, and be, you know, referred to a piece of music and tit for tat. You, uh, you retorted back, and I, I, I just, you know, I think I, I expected more. I, I, I would expect you would have just ignored that comment. But anyways. Um, this this reminds me a little bit about the uh, a little bit of the the whole wind wind turbine you know industrial wind turbine years ago when town turned down the application and taken to the OMB by CAW and town lost the battle and I feel like we're heading down that same road again I find that unfortunate so I'm speaking from here right now and we have to think with this as a councillor but that to me and I I echo your Thoughts, Councillor Rich. I, I, I just find it unfortunate that we, we, we seem to be perhaps heading down that path again. So, but I'll, I'll reserve some of my other comments to the, uh, the official report, um, to Deputy Mayor. But um, a little disappointed. Thank you, Councillor. Are there any other comments uh, from members? Thank you, Mr. Davidson. Uh, so, that will move us then on to item. Uh, into the reports and item 6.2.1, which is the uh, official plan and zoning bylaw amendments for Union Building Corporation of Canada. And I just remind everybody in the room that these we've now moved outside the public meeting uh, stage. We're now in these are decisions. We've had public meetings on these before, uh, so there's no further opportunity for public comments with regard to these particular applications. Um, Ms. Did you have a comment? Mr. Mayor, um, um, Mother Nature, can we can we take a two-minute break? Sure we can. Yeah. How about we do that? Why don't we? <laughs> it's we'll, been quite, quite sure. a long time. We'll reconvene. I, I drank at, a lot of water today. Why don't we? We'll reconvene at uh, at quarter to the hour.
Okay, so we'll call the meeting back to order now. And uh, as I said before, we uh, had a break that we we're moving on to item 6.2.1, the official plan and zoning bylaw amendments for Union Building Corporation of Canada, Unifor, uh, with regard to 116 Shipley and 146 Bruce Road 25. And uh, we'll turn it over to the planner for the report. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so this is a, an official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment. Um, for the subject plans, which are comprised of this sort of triangular piece of property. Currently designated uh, shoreline residential um, in the town's official plan. And um, um, residential, zoned residential first density uh, in, uh, in the zoning bylaw. And the application is to amend the property or the uh, subject lands from that to environmental hazard and institutional, and to rezone the lands. Um, and the envi sorry, the environmental hazard would have an exception to permit uh, a parking lot uh, consisting of eight vehicles. And um, in terms of rezoning, it would be from um, uh, residential first density to environmental protection special. Um, and institutional and the special provision in the EP is uh, for a parking lot of vehicles. <clears throat> so there's a, a clear picture and uh, you can see right there uh, what, what has been the, I guess, existing use, even though it's uh, no longer there at the moment. Um, formerly existing use um, right there. Um, so in terms of uh, surrounding land uses, it's, um, it's uh, residential in institutional, uh, access is via Shipley. Here's uh, the site plan for it. Um, I believe there's three charging stations, one there, one there, and one there uh, involved um, with the proposal. Um, So this is the uh, proposed uh, um, official plan amendment schedule. Um, so the purpose would be to redesignate the lands from shoreline residential to environmental hazard exception. Um, that's the, the hashed marking there. And um, as well as institutional, which would be the uh, a lighter hatched marking there. Um, originally, when... Uh, the notice was circulated, um, the public notice was circulated. The um, proposal was from um, shoreline residential to institutional. As a result of mapping updates recommended by the SVCA, um, the, the EP zone EH designation mapping um, was considered to be uh, inconsistent with the SVCA's mapping. And as I mentioned earlier, we, we tend to <clears throat> recommend um, the SVCA mapping um, be updated uh, to ref or the official plan amendment uh, be updated to reflect the SVCA's recommended mapping at the time of uh, a planning application. So that's, that's what um, resulted in the split designation. And as a result of that, um, change uh, between what went out in the public notice. Uh, we circulated another uh, notice. It was a, a notice of a planning meeting. So um, the intent remains the same as before. It's just the, the underlying designations are different from the original notice. So I just wanted to sort of describe the process there that uh, <clears throat> how that designation came about. So the uh, proposed amendments uh, will recognize an existing parking use as well as per permit vehicular parking in conjunction with the institutional use of the property. Uh, parking lot accommodating four vehicles has existed on site uh, on the site for several years and the owner is proposing to enlarge it to eight vehicles. Similar to the official plan amendment, the zoning uh, does um, something fairly similar in terms of um, the EP zone delineation shifting um, as a result of the SVCA's recommended comments. So the, again, the EP special would uh, recognize a parking lot in that hatched area and 
the institutional zone is the lighter hatched area. Um, so what's changing would be the, the two hatched areas uh, with special provisions for an eight vehicle parking lot. So in terms of uh, interdepartmental and agency consultation, town staff um, will require a stormwater management report um, and they reserve the right to comment on uh, and a grading report, sorry, on the stormwater and grading plan until they receive it. Um, if the applications are not restored, um, approved, sorry, the, the applicant shall restore the lands to their pre-altered state. Uh, the the uh, development will be subject to site plan control um, and that will be brought forward to uh, committee or council through a, a separate um, uh, staff report if approved. Um, the SVCA uh, did not recommend an, uh, preparation of an EIS. Uh, they provided um, EH mapping updates in, in the general area and advised that the OPA and ZBA were, were acceptable uh, to them. And we, we did recirculate the agencies as a resu result of the um, um, SVCA mapping update. Um, and the SVCA commented again on July 26 to that uh, agency letter um, that they, they are um, uh, okay or acceptable of the, uh, the proposed amendments. Uh, so again, uh, covered the EH EP mapping update, that's, that's it. Um, in terms of the provincial policy statement, there's a few pertinent uh, sections that I'll cover here. Section 2.1, natural hazard, natural heritage, sorry. 3.1, natural hazards. 2.6, cultural heritage and archaeology. So, section 2.1, natural heritage. The PPS generally discourages development and site alteration within and adjacent to significant woodlands, fish habitat, and potentially significant significant wildlife habitat and potentially um, the habitat of uh, endangered species and threatened species. Unless it has been demonstrated there will be no impact, harmful impact, um, or that the appropriate federal and provincial regulations are followed. <coughs> um, county planning staff rely on the technical expertise of the SPCA for natural heritage issues. Um, they have the training in ecology and so on that, that we do not uh, as planning generalists. So it's, it's understood the, the SVCA conducted uh, several site visits or at least two um, prior to issuing a permit under Ontario Regulation 16906 in addition to providing comments. In their comment letters, they indicated that they evaluated the proposal and that they are satisfied that the impacts from the proposed development are generally uh, negligible and do not uh, recommend that the EIS be undertaken. In terms of cultural heritage and archaeology, um, the subject lands are located within an area of high archaeological potential. A stage one and two archaeological assessment was completed on the subject lands. The assessment found no, um, no resources on the lands and concluded that provincial interests with respect to archaeological resources um, to the proposed undertaking had, had been addressed. Uh, section 3.1, natural hazards, as a result of the mapping update recommended by the SVCA, uh, the subject lands are proposed to be partially within an environmental hazard area. It's noted that the county, uh, county SAP typically implement, implement mapping updates um, that are recommended by the SVCA. <coughs> Excuse me. So section 3.1 states that development shall generally be directed to areas outside of hazard lands adjacent to rivers, streams, and small inland lake systems which are impacted by flooding hazards and or erosions. Section 3.17 states that development and site alteration may be permitted in those portions of hazardous lands uh, where the, effect, the effects and risks to the public safety are minor and could be mitigated in accordance to provincial standards where the following criteria have been uh, demonstrated and achieved. 
So there's four criteria that have to be uh, demonstrated and achieved um, when developing adjacent to hazard areas. Um, development and site, so A, development and site alteration is carried out in accordance with flood proofing standard, protection work standards, and access standards. Vehicles and people have um, a way to safely enter and exit the area during times of flooding, erosion, or other emergencies. New hazards are not created and existing hazards are not aggravated. And uh, finally, D, no adverse environmental impacts will result. So I'm, <clears throat> in reviewing uh, the four criteria, I'm, I'm generally satisfied they have been met. Um, the proponent has retained a qualified engineer to design a site plan for the proposed use, taking into account the near nearby stream. Vehicles are able to safely enter and exit during flood events and other emergencies. Uh, in the unlikely unlike um, event, um, it's unlikely that a new flood, flood hazard is going to be created um, from the proposed uh, development. Uh, moreover, the town has requested stormwater management plan be completed prior uh, as a condition of site plan approval. Um, with respect to environmental impacts, the proposal was reviewed by the SVCA, who we rely on for technical expertise related to natural heritage issues and um, the impacts were found to be neg negligible. Um, with respect to the county official plan, um, so we, the county official plan has similar policies, um, but I'll just point out one pertinent policy is section 5.8. Um, <clears throat> and that's, uh, that's development and hazard land issues, uh, hazard land areas. So, um, so, just to sort of um, go over my thought process here in terms of the, the county official plan, the purpose of the application is twofold. First, to recognize the existing use of the parking area, and second, to redesignate the subject lands um, to the appropriate designation to facilitate uh, the development of a parking area. Um, <clears throat> as noted, the environmental hazard designation is proposed to be applied to um, a small portion of the lands based on updated mapping. The exception provision is to prevent a parking use within this area. The SVC has indicated they have no objections. Um, so that, that sort of indicates the, the rationale for the dual designation. Um, but uh, it's important um, to provide context regarding the applicable county plan policies um, the county's official plan does contain policies for hazard land areas. Um, however, local mapping um, shall be used where it exists, which is the case here. All planning decisions, uh, of course, shall conform to the county official plan. The county official plan establishes policies for the ex expansion or enlargement of non-conforming uses in hazard ar areas. You noted in section B, uh, to this report, um, the lands have previously been used as a residence for the CAW director, and the applicant has indicated that the lands were used for institutional related parking purposes associated with the CAW center, even while being occupied by the center's director. The lands were more formally established as a parking area um, after the home was demolished in 2001 and permeable paving stones were installed. It has existed in this state ever since. Um, therefore, I, I believe it appropriate to recognize longstanding use of the lands as a legal non-conforming use. In recognizing the existing use of the lands as legal non-conforming, the county's official plan provides provisions whereby expansion uh, and enlargement of non-conforming uses shall uh, can be permitted. Um, there may be practical reasons for permitting um, an existing non-conforming use. Um, in this case, the enlargement of a long-standing parking area has been identified as an operational requirement in order to provide parking close to where it is needed. The parking lot has been designed so that it is large enough for vehicles to reverse out of the stall within the parking area so the access Shipley in a forward-facing forward facing motion. Um, in terms of the local official plan, um, obviously we're, um, the, 
the application is for an amendment to the local fishing plan, official plan. Um, as noted, the SVCA has recommended uh, hazard mapping be updated. Um, to the appropriate EH designation uh, in conjunction with the institutional use. Um, similarly, the zoning, um, not, to, not to beat a dead horse here, um, the zoning uh, is to be updated to um, an EP special in institutional. So that's uh, obviously what's being applied for. Town comments are as follows. Um, I think we covered that. Um, sorry, I'll move on to the public comments. I think we, we've covered the, uh, the agency comments. Uh, so the public comments, for brevity, brevity um, I, I consolidated the comments basically into um, categories uh, which seem to overlap with one another, and, and hopefully I captured um, most of the comments. So... Uh, Safety issues related to pedestrian and cycling uh, uses on Shipley uh, as well as traffic were identified uh, as a concern throughout a number of the comments received. Um, as I noted uh, just a minute ago, uh, it's my opinion that the proposed parking area will um, mark an improvement uh, in terms of um, the functional safety of Shipley as it relates to the parking area. Previously, vehicles would have to reverse into Shipley. Um, uh, now, the proposal calls for those vehicles to enter in a forward-facing direction. Um, further safety measures, such as enhanced signage, uh, can be implemented through uh, the site plan control process. The number of traffic um, uh, vehicles um, using Shipley uh, will not increase dramatically as a result of this uh, proposed development. Uh, another common comment was Unifor has parking related elsewhere. Um, Ron touched on this um, in his uh, deputation. From what I understand, the, the Cove residence is located nearby, and this serves a parking, um, this parking area serves a use for, for that specific residence, which I understand is, um, is oversubscribed at the moment, um, and it's in low, close proximity. It is impractical, uh, impractical I think, for, um, for users to um, park on top of the hill and then access uh, the Cove residence uh, via the stairs and through the complex. That, that seems to be quite a distance having walked it myself. Um, there are some concerns regarding the electrical hazards associated with the equipment. Um, again, as Ron Davidson had pointed out, the electrical wiring that's been uncovered, I believe, is from a um, the former residence there. And <coughs> I may be able to clarify, but I, I don't my sense was it, it's not live wiring and it's not, not associated with the charging stations. So the um, proposed uh, amendment amendments will permit um, charging stations within the subject lands area, um, but there is um, on the site plan a, an electrical building located outside of this area. That would not be a permitted use. Um, so uh, a redesign of the location of where that electrical building would be required. It's my understanding that the concrete pad where that electrical building is located uh, or proposed to be located um, was, was part of the former um, director's residence uh, to some extent. Um, there's concerns over how the former parking area was established. Um, and, and I think we've covered that. It's, it's the former residence house, um, and it has been used for that use since the 1950s until 2001 when it was demolished. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not going to cover things that have already been covered in, in great detail, but there was concerns about tree removal, that, which uh, Ron Davidson um, touched on in terms of the number of trees removed. Um, and it, it appears that um, I could validate that through uh, Google Images. Um, concerns over safety risks, I, I don't foresee 
an increase in crime rates or safety issues as a result of the proposed amendments and uh, concerns regarding the impact to uh, fish habitat. And, and again, we lean on the uh, SVCA as technical, technical experts and um, are generally satisfied uh, with the proposal given the recommendation or the comments by the SVCA. Um, I'll, try, I'll try not to cover things that have been covered in great detail because um, I'm cognizant of the time. Uh, there was a comparison to a previous planning application, and, and while I can appreciate um, there's similarities between uh, this application and a former one in terms of the location and proximity, uh, the proposed uses and impacts to the the, uh, the water course are different and, of course, um, should be viewed through a different policy context. So, in summary, um, the neighborhood is characterized by two predominant uses, namely residential and institutional. Um, the neighborhood has evolved over the past number of years uh, with both uses, um, both, both uses uh, evolving in conjunction with one another. <coughs> I've covered a lot of the, the issues in terms of the electrical stations, um, but in terms of compatibility, it's my opinion that the proposed use is relatively small in scale and can be adequately, adequately integrated into the form and function of the surrounding neighborhood without impacting compatibility. Several examples uh, exist throughout the town where small scale institutional parking um, coexists with residential uses. Uh, the use of site plan control, control can further implement um, measures such as landscaping and other elements to address concerns raised by the public, including issues of privacy and lighting. Um, generally satisfied with respect to the environmental review provided by the SVCA that there'll be negligible impacts on the natural heritage features of the surrounding area. And I do not foresee uh, a concern with um, human health, health and safety as a result of the uh, proposed use in proximity to the water course. And based on, my, based on the foregoing, it's my recommendation that the proposal is consistent with the PPS, conforms to the Bruce County official plan, <coughs> and the intent and purposes of the Town of Saugeen Shores official plan and zoning bylaw. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Uh, comments from members of the committee? We'll start with Councillor Matheson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Through you, um, a couple questions. I'm looking at a picture of the parking lot as it exists right now. Will there be a walking path going from this parking lot to the Cove residences? There is there already? Okay. Um, my qu another question is, with the existing parking lot, can we not just extend it? Or is it because of the environmental hazard area? Or can we not re classify that environmental hazard area to, to extend the existing parking lot for another eight parking spaces. Again, looking at the picture on Google Maps, it looks like there's uh, enough room on the side there. Um, well, I think, I think there was a couple things with that. Um, one was uh, to, to enhance safety. Um, so the cars right now um, are backing into Shipley. I'm talking the existing parking lot. Oh, you're talking down, down Can here. Can we not just Cove? extend it closer to Shipley Avenue? Because they have an entrance that goes off of Bruce Road 25. Is there not enough room to put in enough? There's the creek in there. I think the important thing to be, you want to turn your mic off there for me. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, I think the important thing to remember here is that what we're dealing with is the zoning bylaw and official plan amendments. If the zoning bylaw and official plan amendments pass, then we'll move on to a site plan control, which is re which is a requirement uh, should these pass. And at that stage, the design configuration of of the proposed parking lot would would be would come into figuring. So I think to keep if we can focus the discussion on whether or not a parking lot is of any configuration is an appropriate use on the property, uh, and and. And flowing from that, whether the zoning bylaw or official plan amendments are appropriate, I think that would be uh, where I would like to see the discussion head. Do you have further comments uh, with regard to that? Uh, Councillor Mike Myatt. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And uh, 
to you to the planner I you know you mentioned two uh, two primary uses for this area you know, being residential and institutional I would suggest that there's a third primary use and that's the uh, main connecting link from County Road 25 through the Port Algon Beach um, no one I you know I mean the signs just went up Great Lakes waterfront uh, trail route so I I like to think that there's three three primary use that's the only road in the only road out um, it's, and it's, uh, it's, it's a well-used trail linkage between County Road 25 through to Port Algon Beach. So I, I, I think it's a little misleading when it says there's only two uses. I think that third use is a, a pretty big use. And I, um, I won't be supporting the recommendation. I, I, I find this whole application unfortunate, the path we're heading down here. I know I, I, I get a, a pretty good feel, I think, where it could head, and I, and I find it unfortunate. But you have to, as a counselor, make these decisions with, with, with here versus your, with, with your heart. But I am using this tonight when I, when I want to talk about um, the Great Lakes Waterfront Trail. Uh, this is our main route for cyclists wanting to get to Port Algon Beach via, via Shipley Avenue, Shipley Trail. Um, Shipley Avenue is a dead end road, one road in, one road out, well used road. And um, parking lots be directly beside a very busy mail pickup area with post office boxes and a flyer box. I use that road regularly with walking and cycling, um, sometimes running when my legs don't give out. But you know, I, it's a bus, bus unloading area to that entrance. Um, the residents along Sogging, around Shipley Avenue, are, are adamantly opposed to this. And and the path we're heading down again is an, is an unfortunate. Depending on how the motion goes this evening, well, back in the 1980s, and I said this at the last meeting, the Shipley Avenue residents in Sogging Township days talked about this. There was a decision made to put the parking up on top of the hill. We were through this whole, uh, I wasn't here at the time, but this whole discussion took place back in the 1980s and it was resolved with the parking. I mentioned the last meeting, why are we having this conversation again? But I mean, the ship sailed now. The recommendations have been made by the planner. So now we have to make the decision tonight, yay or nay. But I, just, uh, I'm disappointed even got to this, this point. There's a new parking lot up top. I don't know why the electrical st stations can't be placed up top. Maybe they are adding them up there too. Anyways, I I, I won't be supporting it. I think it's I think it's a, I think it's an incorrect recommendation and a, um, unfortunate we're at this position we are. Thank you, Councillor Myatt. Further comments? Uh, we'll start with uh, Councillor Dave Myatt. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and through you, uh, question is. The existing zoning is residential. So what are the allowable uses that the Unifor or the Union Corporation can do with that right now? And so I'm anticipating that the answer to that question will be they can build a house there because it's a residential. So when they build a house, it's a, it's a fair chunk of property. How many parking spaces would be allowed if it, there's a driveway, obviously a driveway and a parking area required for a residential property, how much would they be allowed with a house on that property? That's a good question. I, I'm not sure offhand. Um, I don't know, unfortunately. So I, I'm, I'm going to assume that the configuration... Oh. The parking provisions, and this is just a matter for the, for the record, is allows a driveway a maximum of seven and a half meters wide for this property. Uh, and if it was outdoor parking, a maximum, if you pass the bylaw tonight, up to 50% of the front yard could be devoted to parking. Uh, but that isn't to say that you couldn't have parking in, in a garage. So you could, you know, you can imagine that you could have a few vehicles on this property. It's, we don't put a maximum number of parking spaces, just a maximum amount of area in a front yard for parking. Well, I'm, when I look at that aerial photograph, when I, w when I went by there a couple of days ago to look at it, uh, I imagine that the current, albeit illegal, 
or non-conforming parking lot that exists there or existed there up until the area was uh, was re rearranged uh, was where the original parking would have been when there was a house on that property. And so, um, I'm, what I'm getting at is is within the allowable uses, could they not establish what they're trying to do without getting a, a zoning change? I, I think I think the use being associated with an institutional use differs in terms of um, frequency of trips and so on, as opposed to a, a, a residential use. Um, hence, hence the uh, the requirement for an amendment. Um, I can appreciate that perhaps there'd be similarities in the number of vehicles that would be permitted under the same uses, but I, I don't I don't think that keeping it in a residential designation would be appropriate for institutional related parking. But um, yeah, it could be, again, because of the num uh, difference in terms of the, the type of use, they, they are substantially parking, but um, the, the impacts are, are somewhat different, I suppose. Answers it, any further uh, questions? Uh, Councillor uh, Minaj. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. So, through you then to Dan. So, I, I was going to object on fact based information through your presentation because uh, you can continue to say that it's legal non conforming and it's an existing parking lot. And yet, the other eminently qualified planner in the room, not, not wishing to pit planner against planner, but when I asked Mr. Davidson if this was a legal non-conforming parking lot, he said clearly it is not, and it is an illegal use. So you, as a planner representing us in, in and the county, uh, are saying that it is legal non-conforming. Can I make that you? Can I make that case with you and say that it can't be legal non-conforming? It has to be illegal. I have a couple others, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I could maybe address that one. Um, my thought process with respect to the, the legal non-conforming, um, and based on information provided to me by the applicant, the uh, existing parking area has existed, uh, I'll call it formerly existing because it's it's no longer there, um, in, in its current state or formerly current state, um, since 2001, when the the um, director's residence was torn down, um, prior to that, from what I understand, the residence, although occupied by the director, was used in a somewhat institutional um, fashion. Like the the parking area associated with the residence also functioned as uh, or served as institutional parking to some extent. Um, so based on sort of the, the length and time that the the, uh, the property existed in the existing use from 2001 and its um, previous use, I, I do feel it uh, appropriate to, to recognize it as a, as a legal non-conforming use. Okay, so follow up that then, Mr. Deputy Mayor. So who, who told you that, that the, the primary residence of the director of, of the U CAW was was being used as a parking lot. Where where did you get that information? The, it was supplied to me by the applicant uh, in an email, um, which is an appendix to this report. Um, okay, so it it's been provided by the applicant. That Correct. They believe that, that the use was a parking lot, an institutional use parking lot. It still would have been an illegal use of. Like if, if, we're, if I'm living there in a house and then I'm offering my spaces as parking for other people to use that don't live in my house or aren't visiting me in my house, is that not an illegal use of a, of, of a, of a piece of residential property? I'm going to move on. Um, the other thing that you say, uh, Dan, is that uh, if, we were to, if we were to deny this application and it didn't get appealed, 
and it was simply denied. Your documents say that it, everything will be returned to the pre-altered state. Can you tell me what the pre-altered state is for this property? Uh, that, that's a town requirement. Uh, so that uh, requirement would have to be facilitated through the town. I, I don't know what the pre-altered state was, what it would be returned to. Wouldn't it be required to be returned to a residence, to a home? I, I, okay, I'll move on. Thank you. Um, Mr. Deputy Mayor, th there's always room for compromise and there's always room to work with our corporate partners in the community. And I heard the same mentioned before. So maybe a new eight unit parking lot that, that could easily be, or may, I mean, you cut Mr. Matheson off, Councillor Matheson off saying it wasn't relevant. I think it is. I think that that the development, the further development of the cove area parking, if there was any room for increasing that by four spots, then we could only maybe approve this for four spots, not for eight spots, because the, the combination of the, of the two would meet the intent. Um, but there is, there's always room for compromise, and I, and I don't feel like we're getting there. I think that the residents have made a strong point, a number of strong points of concern, the uh, planning authority, Mr. Davidson, has refuted many of them, if not all of them, and our own planner has said that he believes that, that this is this is in all good faith. This is a good a good use of of the land in that area. I have a couple of alternate suggestions. So when when could those come forward? How how would you want those to be discussed and and uh, and, and have everybody and I'll have an opportunity to to hear about them? I think ultimately, I mean, this property belongs to the applicant. Um, they've put to, they've put forward a, a, a request uh, for a zoning bylaw official plan amendment to accommodate something they want to do. This committee is going to decide whether or not those amendments are appropriate. But in terms of alternate things that they may do with their property, I mean, those are things that are, they're going to have to decide. The best people to talk to would be them. If you uh, after following this discussion, uh, should it. I, you know, should council reject this, then they'll be doing something with their property, presumably, and and that's who you would discuss it with and win. But I, I, this committee isn't charged with with coming up with ideas for their property. We're charged with deciding whether or not this application uh, uh, is appropriate or not. Uh, back to back to you, Dan. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to put you on the hot seat here. Uh, for for me to make my final decision, I guess I need to know. Um, it's been said before that it doesn't matter what the zoning is; any zoning can be changed at any time. And and so this is this is residential waterfront residential zone. If there was a home today on that lot waterfront residential zone, would you still be of the opinion that it would make good planning sense to change it into a parking lot and not leave it as a residential home? If the home was in good standing, you'd be okay, as a planner, you'd be okay with, with the demolition of a good home to make a parking lot in this area. Or are you basing your decision on the fact that you believe it's legal non-conforming? I, I, I mean, I'm basing my, my opinion on the merits of the application before me, the, the site plan that was submitted. Um, the impacts to the neighborhood, compatibility with the neighborhood, and so on. Um, I, you know, I, I don't want to venture down the road of hypotheticals um, because it, it's really hard to without, you know, the merits of that application being presented in front of me and, and having time to to think about the impacts of, of a hypothetical situation. So I, I don't want to go down that road, but... What I will say is, is I do based on, um, you know, what, what was provided to me and what was submitted and what I feel the impacts to the neighborhood and so on are. I do feel it is is good planning ultimately at the end of the day. Anything further from members? I want to uh, just uh, I have a I have a couple of things, but Dan, I just wanted to say uh, before we move on. 
thank you for your perseverance here. Dan, everyone should know Dan's been sitting in that chair since five o'clock, uh, and uh, so four and a half hours of this uh, grilling is it would be uh, enough for any human being. So we appreciate your uh, your uh, work, Dan. Um, but I, I uh, my um, my comments, couple of comments. Then first, uh, um, I think that. I, mean, I disagree with the planner's recommendation and on the basis of some planning arguments of my own, not on the basis of any, I should point out any particular resentment. I don't bear any resentment to toward Unifor um, whatsoever. Um, the, uh, the key issues with regard to this to me are right in the objectives of the official plan of the town Saugeen Shores. Um, the objectives, uh, the first objective under growth management um, well, not the first one, the second one, B, to require a minimum 10% of all new growth to occur in the built-up area through intensification. Uh, we've heard over and over again uh, from the, from Bruce County Planning that intensification is important, that we should be intensifying the settlement area. In fact, uh, we've faced a number of applications where um, we have changed zoning in particular to encourage increased intensification. This is the opposite of intensification. To encourage the efficient use of land in the settlement area, uh, what is... Uh, the efficient use of land in the settlement area, well, settlement, right, houses. Um, uh, to identify housing opportunities in association with the recreational amenities of the town. Uh, I would argue Unifor is a recreational amenity. The planner himself made the statement a few minutes ago that people across the community use their sports facilities, and we are tremendously grateful to the community for Unifor's willingness to allow uh, our use of those facilities. Uh, and so... This is a great residential opportunity, a housing opportunity next to those residential amenities. Uh, to identify opportunities for residential infill in the settlement area. Uh, this is an opportunity for residential infill in the settlement area. Uh, so there's, I mean, what did I just list there? Four or five objectives, official plan objectives adopted by this council and supported by this community in which developing of a parking lot in a residential, shoreline residential area, a place where that did have a home on it. Uh, and time, you know, all of this is sort of based on a time lapse, really. I mean, if this had happened, if this house had been tore down yesterday, we would be looking at it differently, I think, than if we're, than since it was tore down, uh, what, uh, 18 years ago. Uh, but, the, but that is irrelevant in my mind. What's relevant is the fact that a home was placed there, could be there, uh, is intended to be there, uh, and now we're looking at making it a parking lot in... Uh, in direct uh, uh, contravention of our very objectives that we've established through the official plan. There's also, I think, a bit of circular logic in the planning report in that it says, the report, uh, the planner's argument is that, uh, I have it right here, um, it is noted that the area and configuration of the subject lands is not sufficient to support residential uses under current zoning provisions. Um, and that may be true, but a parking lot is also not supported under current zoning provisions. So you see the, see the problem there. You can amend it to do this or you can amend it to do that. Uh, it's zoned shoreline residential. Uh, our, obviously our intent is for it to be residential. Um, just as the applicant could just as easily come with a home and seek the zoning, the zoning amendments required to build that home as they could come with a parking lot and seek the zoning amendments to to have that. So I think the argument that it isn't can't have a residence on it is is that you could make the same argument that it can't have a parking lot on it or anything else that we might have to amend the, amend the zoning bylaw to accommodate. So I think from a pure planning standpoint, reading our documents, looking at our zoning bylaw, uh, and looking at our intent uh, for shoreline residential properties, including this one. Um, that the development or the proposal is uh, not appropriate. Uh, so I, uh, I won't be supporting the recommendation on that basis. So we'll move on to the recommendation. Uh, and the recommendation is that local official plan amendment SSOPA 30-18.44 for the properties described as part lots 1 and 2, plan 442, town of Saugeen Shores, geographic township of Saugeen be approved and the necessary bylaw be forwarded to council for consideration of adoption and the county of Bruce for approval and that zoning bylaw amendment Z 2418.44 for the same properties as described above be approved and the necessary bylaw be forwarded to council for adoption. Questions or comments to the motion or recommendation. Seeing none, all in favor. 
Opposed. That's defeated. Okay, now that will move us then on to item 6.2.2. Uh, which is a staff report with regard to pre-servicing agreement of Lord Elgin Estates Development Holiday Inn. And uh, Jay Posner has the report. Jay. So as, you, as you know uh, from previous uh, correspondence to Council, there's a Holiday Inn proposed at this location. It's under appeal. The variance, rather, is under appeal by a, a neighboring property owner, uh, yet the uh, because of uh, how hotels are with a strategic priority for the town to, to situate a hotel, we think it's uh, appropriate for the town to consider pre-servicing agreement with the developer so that he could service the property to support a hotel and when and if he uh, settles his hearing as we expect with the neighboring property owner, he'll come, we'll come forward with the re remainder of the site plan uh, requirements and I'll leave it there. Okay, we have a recommendation. I'll read it and then we'll take any comments. That Council pass a bylaw to enter into a pre-servicing agreement with Lord Elgin Estates Development Limited to facilitate the pre-servicing of lands to support construction of a new hotel. Questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, all in favor? That's carried. Okay, so that takes us right to adjournment, I guess. That's sad. I have a motion moved by... Councillor uh, Dave, Councillor Dave Mayette, seconded by, uh, I assume the vice deputy. Or was that John? That's one. All right, sorry. Moved by Councillor Mayette, Dave Mayette, seconded by Councillor Rich, that this planning committee meeting of August 20, 2018, hereby adjourns at 9:30 p.m. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you all very much. Have a good evening.